All right, thank you for joining me in this episode of The Gospel Truth. I'm your host, Marlon Wilson, and we got another great one today. We got a great debate, man. And, um, you know, as we see the gospel truth grow, as we see the gospel truth continue to evolve into a greater and greater platform that will glorify God at all costs, um, I am just so thankful for uh, you guys' participation. Not only the audience and you guys coming in every debate and you guys are watching, and you guys are subscribing, you guys are sharing, you guys are even giving financially, um, but also the debaters who are volunteering their time to come in and, and, and create an episode to create content with me. And I can, I can, it's just a great thing. And today I have Tyler Vela and Mr. Will Duffy, and we're going to be debating the, the God of the future. Does, does the Bible teach that God knows the future? And that should be a very interesting one because... Once again, it's one of those areas of, of, of pretty great theological contention. And uh, I expect these two to put on a great, great debate. Uh, a lot of information is going to be thrown around. So as I always say, these debates are not just for entertainment value, but they're educational value as well. So we all can grow. All right. Uh, so before we bring these guys in, let me go ahead and uh, go for a couple of announcements that have come up. All right. Coming up tomorrow, June 6th, I have Dr. Jonathan Salfate. Safati, I think it's Safati, I believe I'm not saying right, Safati, um, he's coming in, we're going to be discussing evidence for young earth creation, um, so that should be a good one, I just contacted him like a couple days ago, and he said, yeah, come on on, so we're going to have fun with that one, uh, after that, I have coming up, uh, my first two-on-two debate, Trinitarians versus Unitarians, is Jesus the God of the Bible, um, so Cody Sorensen had to step out, but Merrick Kaiser was able to get another partner, so this one is still on schedule for June 9th at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. After that, I have Travis Worth versus Robert Barnhart, and can Christians forfeit their salvation? Um, that should be an interesting one. Let's go ahead and make sure you mark the calendars. That's one. That one is at 12 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, so make sure that you mark that. And then after that, I have Ricky Croning versus Justin Time Taylor Coleman. Um, and there, and uh, Ricky is a Christian and Justin is a Rastafarian. So this one's going to be Christianity and Rastafarianism. So we're going to have a discussion concerning that topic. That's coming up June 16th at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So make sure you mark your calendars for these upcoming shows. That is just the next four shows. Please subscribe. Please like. Please share. Do what you have to do um, to make sure that you don't miss out on any shows or any live, any show, any shows, any videos uploaded or anything like that. Make sure you also are flowing over to the iTunes podcast, uh, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, all those uh, podcast platforms. This content is on, so make sure you're over there subscribing there as well. Um, with that said, let me bring these guys in. You guys are pretty familiar. I suspect you guys are pretty familiar with these two, but they're going to introduce themselves anyway for those who don't know them. So let me bring these fellas in. What's up, guys? How y'all doing? Hey, how are you? Doing well, doing well, man. Hey, Will, man, you have another baby on the way, man. This is number five, right? Number five? Yes. I think they call that a handful at this point. Oh, yeah, definitely, man. I got three of them, three little ones, and they're a handful. So I can only imagine what five of them is, man. What's going on with you, Tyler, man? You you you're still on the hype when you can't see the Chiefs winning the Super Bowl last year, man? I, I am. I'm still living the dream. I still have the flag out in front of the house. Uh, still rejoicing. Mahomes is going to bring uh, another. He's going to bring another ring to the Chiefs before he gives another one to uh, to his to his fiance. I think. So. <laughs> well, my Ravens are right behind you, bro. So don't, don't watch out, man. They coming. Are, they, yeah, are they you going to go? Are you going to go to Vegas and watch? You going to go to Vegas? I think I will, man. I think I might take a yeah? trip out there to check them out, see uh, the new stadium and everything. So you never know, sweet. man. See what's up, man. Yeah, 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 yeah man. Good stuff. I thank you guys for joining me. So at this time, I do want to give you guys an opportunity to go ahead and introduce yourself to the audience. Uh, start with Tyler. If you don't mind, give a quick introduction to yourself, man. Uh, I'm Tyler Vela. I run uh, the blog and podcast and YouTube channel, The Free Thinker Podcast. Deals mostly with uh, naturalism and atheism and, and dealing with some of those issues, uh, but also deals a lot with um, uh, some kind of theological issues dealing with open theism, uh, dealing with reformed theology, Calvinism, determinism, things along those lines. Um, I am an ordained elder in the Presbyterian Church in America, and I'm currently working on my master's degree in biblical studies at Reformed Theological Seminary. I don't have as many uh, little little Tylers running around as you all do. I got two 
little ones. I, I don't think that qualifies as a handful, though. Maybe, a, I don't know, a, a pinch full or something. But, uh, yeah, so glad to be here. All right, cool. Thank you, Tyler. All right, Will, go ahead and give a quick introduction to yourself, man. Yeah, hi. So Will Duffy here. Um, I actually own and operate opentheism.org along with Pastor Bob Enyart. And uh, I am leading the charge with uh, open theists in taking the beard back. <laughs> you take, you take, taking the beard back, Will? Come on, man. <laughs> but I, I'm, 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 taking, taking, I'm bringing back Edwards in the, in the clean shave and reform, so it's all right. <laughs> good stuff. Good stuff, fellas. All right, man. Like I said, thank you guys for joining me, man. I do appreciate you guys coming on. So this debate will be turning. Uh, does God, does the Bible teach that God knows the future? This would be, like I said, a very theological heavy debate. Um, so we're going to go with the opening statement is going to be 15 minute opening statements. Then we're going to transition to a 60 minute discussion. Uh, when I interrupt, unless I hear ad hominems or any foul, foul, terms thrown back and forth or anything like that which i would suspect with you guys you guys pretty uh, are good at keeping it keeping it kosher then we go transition transition to a five minute closing and then q a from the audience sounds good great all right so uh uh tyler you're arguing the affirmative in this debate so you're up first for your 15 minute opening statement all right uh do i go or are you gonna set a timer you on the audience yeah i got the timer go for it man go for uh, it. all right all right, well, thank you, Marlon, for uh, hosting this discussion, and thank you, Will, for joining me. I'd like to start with a reminder of the topic. Does the Bible teach that God knows the future? Here I take this to be a question about if God has significant knowledge of the future, not the kind of knowledge that he would have if he created a purely chemical cosmos and could know all chemical reactions, for example. Here, we're concerned with more significant knowledge. Does God know the fates of nations, the eternal destinies of men, the sins they'll choose, and so forth? Basically, those facts of reality which are rooted in the free will actions of significantly free and morally responsible agents within his good creation. Here, I'll actually be arguing from an internal critique of the negation of the question as strong evidence for the affirmative. From here, there are multiple places that I could go to address the innumerable issues with open theism. I could go after its metaphysical commitment to a libertarian indeterminate notion of freedom, as well as the numerous problems that arise with such a view, often arbitrarily making the free agent actually neither free nor morally responsible. I could attack systematic theological considerations about how open theism necessarily entails those who affirm it to deny fundamental aspects of the nature of God besides omniscience, like aseity, immutability, timelessness, simplicity, and so forth. However, I'm sure these will come up in our discussion in the Q&A to follow. So what I want to do with my brief time here is to talk about their fundamental hermeneutical flaw and give some examples how this plays out in their own proof texting, showing that their view is not drawn from the scripture, which we all agree is the ultimate authority, at least we all say that it should be. Open theists tend to have a poor grasp of the hermeneutical principle called the analogy or the rule of faith. This is the principle of interpretation where we prioritize the clear over the unclear, the didactic over the narratival. We understand that the clearer and more theologically intended passages should take the controlling priority over how we should draw theological inferences from narratives or parables or apocalyptic or poetry, for example. Here, open theists commonly will take their narratival inferences as the controlling concept, and then reinterpret the more clear and didactic statements of scripture about the same topic. So for them, narrative passages that have God changing his mind in the course of time, for example, take conceptual priority over more expressly stated passages that God knows all things in heaven uh, above and earth below and does not change his mind like a man. This manner of interpretation is wildly problematic and inconsistent. Here, open theist and New Testament scholar Gregory Boyd argues that all he and his ilk are doing is taking the normal or the plain reading of these passages as literally as we would others. But is it the case that they take the plain meaning of any of these texts or, or that they understand it in the light of clearer passages? Well, let's look at Genesis 22:12 as a common passage used by open theists themselves like Boyd and Duffy to attempt to demonstrate their case that God knows, uh, grows in knowledge or has to have something demonstrated to him about a free decision before he knows it. Boyd argues that he just takes the plain meaning. 
But let us see if simply applying the analogy of faith shows how wrong his handling of the text is. Duffy often mentions his own website where he lists 33 categories of verses that he claims support open theism. And this text is his number one example for category number 14, which he calls God wants to see what men will do, which Duffy himself describes as, quote, he tests men, looks to see, searches, and didn't know what men would do, end quote. Here, I think we'll see how Duffy and other open theists handle these texts is just abysmally bad and why we should then question all of his categorical treatments of scripture. Following Abraham's willful attempt to sacrifice Isaac in accord to the demand that God had placed upon him, just before the knife was plunged, the angel of the Lord calls down from heaven and tells Abraham, quote, do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me, end quote. Now, there are numerous problems with the open theist handling of this text and whether or not the open theist can consistently apply their method of interpretation elsewhere. Notice in providing this passage as a proof text for the openness thesis that God learned something new and thus they claim the future was unsettled to God, it actually raises questions of if God can even know the present or even the past given their own hermeneutics. Does God know the future quickly becomes, does God even know the present? Notice that in the passage we're told that God now knew that Abraham feared the Lord. Well, was it not the case that Abraham feared the Lord before Genesis 22? Are we to believe that prior to this, God did not know Abraham's inner spiritual condition and convictions? If we think of 1 Chronicles 28, 9, which says that God understands every intention of the thoughts of our hearts, or 1 Samuel 16, 7, which says that God knows us not as we know each other, that is by our external actions, but rather he knows our hearts, then we can see why it's so problematic that on the open theistic view, God does come to know Abraham by his external action, which is the very thing 1 Samuel 16 says is not how he knows us. On open theism, God needed to test Abraham to know the heart of God. Notice, God wasn't testing Abraham to know the propositional truth about if Abraham would follow the command in the future but rather that he needed the test in order to know Abraham's own heart by observing if Abraham would follow the command in the future. He wasn't trying to find out if Abraham would drop the knife, but if Abraham was God-fearing in his own heart. That is, open theism cuts off the nose to spite the face of determinism. In order to avoid a settled future, they propose a reading of the passage where God does not even know the present or know the heart of Abraham, which is expressly the kinds of knowledge we are told repeatedly in the Bible that God has. However, we can add more to why their refusal to properly employ the analogy of faith causes problems for them. In Romans 4, we're told that Abraham had such strong faith in God that he believed in God's promise that Sarah would bear him a son, even when they were well beyond childbearing age. Starting in 4.18, Paul tells us that he did not labor in unbelief and that in hope against hope and without becoming weak in faith and while giving glory to God, Abraham believed God's promise that he would become the father of many nations and that this was credited to him as righteousness. And this is the same righteousness that's compared to our saving righteousness imputed to us by, in Christ by our faith. Well, this was far before Genesis 22 in the life of Abraham. So is it really the case that God didn't know until he observed the free action of Abraham in Genesis 22, if Abraham really honored God or not, if he'd already been justified by his faith? Abraham also shows up in the hall of faith in Hebrews 11, and his faithfulness is shown to begin with his call and sojourn out of uh, Ur of the Chaldeans up through his commitment to the command of God in Genesis 22. Only on open theism, God needed to have this test in order to discover how Abraham would respond in order to know the heart of Abraham. But in Hebrews 11, 19, we're told that the heart of Abraham, from the moment he was given the command, was committed to do the deed. Why? Because he believed in his heart that Isaac was the child of promise and that even if he killed him, that God would raise him up from the dead. Wouldn't God know that about Abraham at the time prior to their ascent up the mountain when he knew that in his heart? 
why would he need to, this test to be completed for him to know this about Abraham's heart? If we're told over and over in the Bible, and open theists say they agree with it, that God knows our hearts perfectly. So on open theism and their use of passages like Genesis 22 to the exclusion of these more didactic and clearer ones, such as Romans 4 and Hebrews 11, the open theist not only denies future knowledge to God, but also implicitly denies present knowledge and the intimate heart and soul knowledge of every person, which the Bible expressly ascribed to God. In fact, there are still more problems with their view. For Boyd and Duffy and others, this test was enough for God to know Abraham was faithful to him. But given the long history of Abraham being faithful to him that we're told about, and him still needing the test to know his heart, what confidence could God possibly have that Abraham would continue to be faithful to him? It seems that when a test is over, a new test would be needed if God doesn't know the future, and a new one, and one after that, and one after that, and so forth. For if libertarian freedom is actually true and God does not know the future free choices of men, then God could always be caught unawares by any of us at any time. Now, remember what Boyd and others like Pinnock and Sanders and Duffy will say. They're, they, they're just reading the plain meaning of these passages. Well, are they? We saw with Genesis 22, they're not. Do they do it consistently? What about Genesis 3 where God walks in the garden and calls out to, Ab uh, to Adam to find out where he is? Boyd quickly dismisses this as an anthropomorphism because of his commitment to God's present knowledge of where Adam and Eve were at that very moment. But why? Why not take the plain meaning? What is it textually about Genesis 3 and the statement of God as opposed to Genesis 22? Why is one the plain meaning and one must be taken as anthropomorphic? It seems simply because the open theist begs the question on the selected passage that they want to support their view. Or what about another event in the life of Abraham, when God comes to Abraham as a theophany with the two angels to inform him of his plans for Sodom and Gomorrah and the other cities of the plain? In Genesis 18, 20 to 21, we read, quote, And the Lord said, The outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is indeed great, and their sin is exceedingly grave. I will go down now and see if they have done entirely according to its outcry, which has come to me. And if not, I will know, end quote. How does the open theist read a passage like this? Do they take the plain meaning? In which case, they would need to deny that God even knows past events. God here is coming to see if what they had done matches the outcry that had come up against his throne, which if read according to the openness thesis would entail that God didn't know the past or if it was even presently true of the cities in the plain. In fact, the openness thesis <clears throat> seems like it would even entail a denial of not only omniscience, the omniscience of God, but also the omnipresence of God, since here to take the plain meaning would also entail that God needed to actually go down to the cities to see for himself. Again, why does the open theist not apply their same hermeneutical commitments to passages like this one? Well, besides special pleading that they just don't like the entailments, which, by the way, I disagree with those entailments also, there's no reason, given the openness thesis and their terminal commitment to do so, showing that they handle text in an entirely ad hoc, inconsistent, and special pleading manner. What about the other favorite openness proof texts, such as the verses that have God saying something like, it never entered my mind, such as in Jeremiah 7, 31, 19, 5, and 32, 35. It, ignoring that the, the Hebrew term lave almost always means the heart and reflects the moral character, meaning these passages clearly reflect God's holiness, that it's not part of his holiness, not dealing with his knowledge, and as such easily fit with the reformed understanding of the prescriptive, uh, of the revealed will of God for humanity, not his decreative will, ignoring all of that, of these three statements, Boyd writes, quote, Three times the Lord expresses shock over Israel's ungodly behavior by saying that they were doing things which he did not command nor decree nor did it enter his mind. However, we understand the phrase, it would at the very least seem to preclude the possibility that the Israelites' idolatrous behavior was in eternally certain in God's mind. If the classical view is correct, we have to be willing to accept that God could in one breath say that the Israelites' behavior did not enter his mind, though their behavior was eternally in his mind. If this is not a contradiction, what is? End quote. 
Well, on open theism, God knows all possible futures. He just doesn't know which one would be actualized. And so it's just flat out dishonest for Boyd to pretend that these actions weren't in the mind of God when his own view affirms that these actions, along with every other possible action, were all eternally in the mind of God. Also, it's just trivially easy to show that these statements are meant to be taken as hyperbole to express the utter wickedness of the actions rather than the metaphysics of the knowledge of God. For the idolatry in these passages is that of following false gods to the point of burning their own children in sacrifice. Yet this is exactly what God warns Israel will do when they fall into idolatry in the land in Deuteronomy 12, 31 and 18, 10. In fact, the child sacrifice to Molech specifically described in Jeremiah 32 is expressly warned against by name in Leviticus 18, 21. Not to mention that the sacrifice of children to false gods by the Jews had already happened just a century before under the reigns of King Ahaz in 2 Kings 16 and King Hosea in 2 Kings 17. So again, given the openness thesis, if they want to try and be consistent with their own hermeneutic, it seems that they cannot even affirm God has past knowledge in that case once again. So for the open theist to say that these statements express the idea that these behaviors never entered God's minds literally is just obtuse. Now, I'd be happy to go into more passages like this and to discuss the philosophical assumptions of libertarian incompatibilistic indeterminacy, uh, but I felt that the, those debates had been done to death and we'd see those in the question and answer anyways. So uh, I just wanted to point out the hermeneutical problems that the openness view has when it comes to passages like those listed above, which they even try to use as their own proof texts, because the question should always come back to what does the Bible teach? Thank you. All right. Thank you, Tyler, for that opening statement. All right, Will Duffy, you're up for your 15 minute opening. And that little, that little ding noise that you hear is that's the one minute warning. I forgot to tell you guys, but that's the one minute warning that you have one minute left. All right. So, Will, you are up for 15 minutes. All right. Our debate resolution is, does the Bible teach that God knows the future? My gracious opponent, Tyler Vela, his fellow Calvinists and even Arminians and Molinists all believe that God knows the future and not just some future events, but the entire future exhaustively. Other than open theists and some Molinists, the majority of Christians believe that God knows the entire future, either because he decreed it or because they claim God is atemporal, meaning he is outside of time or timeless. When Tyler suggested our debate resolution be, does the Bible teach that God knows the future? I gladly agreed as the Bible clearly teaches that God does not have knowledge of the entire future. Further, the Bible is also missing even a single verse in seven categories of verses that I will list that we would expect to see if God knows the entire future and is atemporal. And lastly, the Bible explains how God knows certain future events, and it's not because he decreed everything before the foundation of the world, nor is it because he sits outside of time. Before diving into what the Bible teaches, let's list the types of verses we would expect to see if God has decreed everything or is outside of time and knows the future. Verses in these categories are glaringly lacking. There are no verses that say God is outside of time. The Bible never attributes timelessness to God or says he is in an eternal now. Next, the Bible never says that God created time. It says that he created space, matter, light, and life, but not that he created time. By the way, time cannot be created. Why not? Because creation means going from non-existence to existence, which itself is a before and an after. And since time, therefore, is a precondition of creating, time itself cannot be created. We, <clears throat> we have not a single verse that says God knew each of us before we were conceived. The Bible says he knew us in the womb and even before the womb in the fallopian tube, but the Bible doesn't say he knew us prior to that. There are no verses that say that God exists in the past or in the future. And there are no scriptures showing that God can change the past. Of the hundreds of miracles in the Bible, if he's outside of time, then he could have, but never does, go back in time to intervene. The Bible never once claims that God knows everything that will ever happen, which is what we are debating. And finally, the Bible does not teach 
that God decreed everything that will ever happen. That only comes from philosophy and theologians, not the scriptures. In stark contrast to the absence of verses claiming God is outside of time and knows the entire future, let's look at an overview of the Bible at the most popular events in history and the most important events in our faith. We are going to go from God saying, let there be light, to him saying, it is finished. You will see that what you've been taught about the Bible can only be true if God is in time and does not have knowledge of the future exhaustively. Let's begin remembering that many claim God is immovable, yet the second verse of the Bible, Genesis 1-2, states that at the beginning of creation that God moved over the face of the waters. A timeless being cannot move. The very next verse, Genesis 1-3, tells us that God said, let there be light, and there was light. An atemporal being cannot speak one word after another. An atemporal being cannot say, let there be light. This is why Augustine in his confessions argued that God must have created some bodily creature to utter all the words the Bible attributes to God. Then Genesis 2 says that God brought the animals to Adam in order to see what Adam would call them. This cannot be true if God knows the entire future already. Then we come to Noah's flood in Genesis 6, which says that God regretted making man on the earth and was grieved in his heart at how wicked mankind had become. A God who knows the future would never regret his own actions, as he would know the outcome of them in the first place. And a timeless God cannot experience changes in emotion, such as here going from proclaiming it is very good to being grieved in his heart. And God's actions corroborate what the text tells us. Because God regretted making man, and because he was so grieved, he decided to destroy man, undoing what he started and starting over, as he says in verse 7, because I am sorry I have made them. After the flood, Genesis 8.21 reads, Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done. This is not something a timeless God would say. And notice he said this to himself in his heart. An atemporal God would never tell himself that he will never again do something, as all his actions would be simultaneous. Then we come to Genesis 18 in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. God the Son, in a Christophany, prefigured the incarnation, limiting his power and knowledge. And here told Abraham he will walk down to Sodom to, quote, see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against it, and if not, I will know. If exhaustive knowledge were a necessary divine attribute, then in Sodom, God the Son would not have remained God, but of course he did. Next, we come to the famous story of Abraham being told to sacrifice his son Isaac on Mount Moriah. And as Abraham lifted the knife in obedience to God, the Lord stopped him and said, Now I know that you fear me. An atemporal God would never say, Now I know, nor would he need to test men as he did here with Abraham and throughout the Bible. Next, we come to the book of Exodus, the story of Israel's escaping bondage in Egypt. After Pharaoh let Israel go, Exodus 13 says that God did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near, for God said, lest perhaps the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. Lest, perhaps? These are not the words of a God who knows the entire future and knows how it will all play out. These are words of a God desiring that his people not do something he thinks they might possibly do. Fast forward to the book of Isaiah. Chapter 5 says Israel is God's vineyard and that God expected his vineyard, Israel, to bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. Isaiah then quotes God directly. What more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? God expected one thing and got another. This is not possible if he knows the future exhaustively and sits outside of time. In Jeremiah 3, God says, And I thought after Israel has done all this, she will return to me. But she did not return. Why would God think Israel would return to him if he already knew how the future would play out? Next in Jeremiah is the potter and the clay passage from chapter 18, with God telling Jeremiah, The instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to destroy it, 
If that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will repent of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. Notice God himself says that he will repent of the disaster that he thought to bring upon it. A God with exhaustive foreknowledge would not personally think he will do one thing and end up doing another. And a few chapters later in Jeremiah 32, God tells Jeremiah that the children of Israel have provoked him to anger. An atemporal God cannot be provoked to anger. And this anger was partly the result of the Israelites sacrificing their children to Molech, concerning which God says in verse 35, which I did not command them, nor did it come into my mind that they should do this abomination. God says this unthinkable act never entered his mind. This is not something that a God who knows the future would say. I was hoping Tyler wouldn't try and argue that since God prohibited child sacrifice back in the time of Moses, that this cannot mean what it says. Just as we would use the phrase today, claiming something never entered one's mind is referring back to the original event and not the present. For example, it never entered my mind that Donald Trump would run for president. That is a statement about the past, not the present. Jonah's story is one we know since we were children. God asks him to preach to Nineveh saying, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Was God lying? I argue no. He actually intended to destroy Nineveh in 40 days. A God with exhaustive foreknowledge could not make this statement knowing that they would not be destroyed in 40 days. As we learned in Jeremiah 18, since Nineveh repented, God repented of the harm he thought to bring upon Nineveh, he changed his mind. Jonah 3.10 directly says that God repented. This is the Hebrew word nacham. And in chapter 4, Jonah says, For I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger, and abundant in loving kindness, one who repents. The Bible says God repents. Jonah says God repents. Yet Calvinists and Arminians say God does not repent. Who's right? By the way, eight times the Bible says, like right here, that God is slow to anger. A God outside of time cannot be slow to anger. That is meaningless if God is atemporal. Coming to the New Testament, we start with one of the most significant events in human history, the incarnation of Jesus Christ. John 1 tells us that the Word became flesh. The incarnation is impossible if God is outside of time. An atemporal being cannot become anything. That is a complete contradiction to the meaning of the word atemporal. The incarnation proves that God is in time. God the Son has a one nature past, and his Father became the Father of a Son with two natures. For at the incarnation, the Son took on a human nature and has two natures now and forevermore. Christians refer to this as the hypostatic union. The hypostatic union was not eternal. God the Son was not always a man. This was the joining or uniting of a human nature to his pre-existing divine nature. This is impossible if timelessness is an attribute of God. Luke 2 presents one of the most recognized verses about the young Jesus. Luke writes that Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. This not only describes changes to God the Son, but again to God the Father as well. The statement that Jesus increased in favor with God is a change in the Father. This change in the Father cannot be real if he is outside of time. In Matthew 3, we come to the baptism of Jesus Christ, where verse 17 says, And suddenly a voice came from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. We all know this was the voice of God the Father coming down from heaven. Yet St. Augustine claimed that because God is timeless, He can do nothing in sequence, and so Augustine said God cannot speak one word after the next. So absurdly, Augustine argued that this was not God the Father speaking, but had to be a creature speaking for him. We come to John 17 where Jesus is praying to his Father and says, And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. This is a change. There can be no changes in timelessness. God the Son is remembering and longing for the glory which he shared with the Father in the past, and he's looking forward to returning to such a state after his ascension. Next is the arrest of Jesus in Matthew 26. Peter drew his sword and struck the high priest's servant. So Jesus said to him, 
do you think that I cannot now pray to my father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? Jesus here is claiming to have the ability along with the father to do other than what actually happened. If the future was known to God and therefore settled, this would be a false statement. But the future is open, and this proclamation from Jesus, of course, was truth. John 19 records Christ's final words on the cross. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Nothing is ever finished for an atemporal being. If the doctrine of timelessness is true, in an eternal now, Jesus is still hanging on the cross. But we all know the truth, as Hebrews says five times repeatedly, that Jesus' work on the cross once for all was completed, and he is now at the right hand of the Father and not still hanging on the cross to God. Hebrews 10 tells us that this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. An atemporal being cannot wait for anything. Past, present, and future would all be simultaneously present to him. So what do we do with all the times in the Bible that tell us Jesus is waiting until his enemies are made his footstool? Hebrews 13.8 tells us that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That is a description of the past, present, and future, not timelessness. Similarly, the book of Revelation four times describes God as the one who was and is and is to come. Again, that is a description of time, past, present, and future, not a temporality. Revelation 8 tells us when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Is that time in heaven? Sure sounds like it to me. There are hundreds of more examples like this. Like the fact that the Bible tells us God is patient. A timeless God cannot be patient. Or where the Bible says God is a God of hope. A God who knows the future cannot hope as the future is settled and cannot be changed. In fact, the words foreknowledge and predestination are only literally true of God if he is in time. Foreknowledge means to know beforehand. And predestination means to determine beforehand. A God outside of time cannot know anything beforehand, nor can he determine anything before something else. These words completely lose their meaning if God is atemporal. I'm happy to say that I actually believe the Bible is literally true when it says God has foreknowledge and that God predestines things. My opponent doesn't actually believe these words mean what they say. As you can see, I did not have to find some obscure Old Testament verse to argue that God does not know the future. I did not have to use a controversial translation of a Greek or Hebrew word to argue that God's existence is temporal. Rather, the entire overview of the Bible, going through the main events we are all familiar with, clearly show that God does not know the future and is not outside of time. Thank you. All right, thank you, Will, for the open statement. Thank you both for the open statement. So now we're gonna to transition to our 60 minute discussion. Um, so once again, as long as I don't hear any ad hominems or rude talk, you won't hear from me for 60 minutes, man. So you guys have the floor, and uh, you guys got it, man. Great. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Do you want to start? Do you want me who to start? Wanna, who would ask a question first, man? Go for I, it. I, 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 I spoke first. He can question first. How about that? Yeah, well, well, let's just dialogue. What did you think of my opening statement? Um. To be honest, I, I mean, I'm, I don't mean this condescending. I, I'm not impressed at all um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, you you use the exact passages that I said you would use, and you didn't actually address anything. And most of your statements assertions. So I, I I actually stopped typing because I couldn't keep up with with the amount of just bald assertions that are made. So for example, you say things like a God who is outside time can't do this, and I'm left wondering why. So you, so you say. Uh, a God who's outside time can't move over the waters. Why? A God who's outside time can't can't uh, cannot speak. Cannot be slow to anger. Uh, can't can't know of you know can't can't speak anthropomorphically about if Adam Adam would name the animals. Uh, can't experience change of emotions. Can't regret making. It. it it's just it's just assertion after assertion after assertion. I'm I'm waiting for any type of argument to happen. So I'm I'm honestly not sure where to go because no argument was made. 
Okay, cool. Let's deal with this. So, um, well, let me ask. Let me ask. Sorry, sorry. Let me let me ask you because you used you used a couple of the verses, and I and I'm wondering if you would agree. So, for example, you you went to Genesis 18, which I knew you would, right? And, and you use it as an example of of God learning something new, right? What is it that you think God learned? So you're talking about Sodom and Gomorrah, correct? Yeah, when 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 the angel of the Lord came down, I mean, I think we both probably agree that's a, that's a theophany. That's 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 uh, God. It, 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 it's it's God incarnate. Whether it's a weophany, if it's a Christophany, if it's a son or not specifically, it's it's, it's God incarnate coming down as the angel of the Lord with with two angels, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, what is it that you think God learned in Genesis 18? Um, that he didn't know before. So he learned exactly what he said, which was the present state of Sodom at that time. So you, so you don't, so your view isn't not only that God doesn't know the future exhaustively, God doesn't know the present exhaustively. So I mentioned this in my opening statement. Uh, the fact mm -hmm. that that was a Christophany is important because that was a, temporary limitation of knowledge. So all of the time that we see God walking, talking, and eating with Abraham, he doesn't know what's going on in Sodom. While Where he's on earth in a, in a form, he says out of his own mouth, he has to actually walk to go see how they are, what their present state is. Theoretically, hypothetically, they could have repented in all that time he was spending with Abraham. So, so in your view, so, okay. It, it also says that that he's checking to see if their behavior in the past lived up to the cry that reached him. So so the, so God, though he knows everything, now limits himself in this in this manifestation. So he now doesn't know the present. Does he also not know the past? Then, on your view? Uh, no, not necessarily. <laughs> but well, he, uh, he my, finds, he says that he's coming to find out if if their behavior had been uh, it, it's a past tense. Uh, if, if, if what they had done merits what the outcry that has reached him. So if that's past knowledge, right? So does, does God not know past things now as well? Well, I want to point out before I answer that I'm the one here that's actually taking the Bible at face value and taking it literally. And so I think that's an important thing to point out for the audience. And again, we, not. we don't know. Well, oh, I absolutely am. Uh, and, and, I'm, and I'm taking God's statement as, as, as it means what he says, which is he's going to go see if how they are right now is the same as when there was an outcry against it. Okay. So is, God, is, God, is God omnipresent on your view? Uh, how would you define omnipresence? Present in all places in creation. I would say I define it a little bit differently, and I think this will answer your question. I define omnipresence as God is anywhere he wants to be. So he's not omnipresent. I if mean, he that, doesn't that's just want, what, omnipresent if he just doesn't, means all presence. That's just what the word means. So, sure, you deny yeah, the, if he does, so you deny the classical orthodox position on omnipresence. So you deny omniscience, you deny omnipresence, you deny immutability because now God can change, right on your view, God is changing. You deny, I'm just trying to get the, the attributes that, that the bundle of attributes that you're denying, right? Sure. Do, do you, um, so you deny it? Yep. Yeah. I, I don't. I don't. I don't necessarily deny these attributes. I define them differently. So omniscience for me, the definition is God knows whatever He wants to know. I can define. I mean, I can define a rabbit as a cow if I want to. If I can, if I can make words mean whatever they mean. What, what we're saying is the classical usage of these terms. How every textbook, every systematic theology, every theologian for the past two thousand years means these terms or the relevant cognate in their language means these terms to be all right so so omnipresent being present in all you know if if i go up to the highest height you are there if i go down to shield you are there if I, it, so so god is omnipresent everywhere well you could say well i don't deny omnipresence because i just define omnipresence to not be existing everywhere okay you deny omnipresence you just you you affirm we can call it you know omnipresence i don't care it's just a different thing that's not what anyone means by it all right, one second. So, so I will point out that omnipresence is not the topic of the debate, but I won't use it as a, as a way to get out of answering your question. 
for example, my position is that if God does not want to spend eternity in the lake of fire, he doesn't have to. That's my position. Okay. Yeah, and, and, and I agree. Omnipresence isn't the point. My, my, my argument here is that once you deny um, uh, uh, for, you know, exhaustive foreknowledge, this whole can of worms is what opens. That you, you open this massive Pandora's box of inconsistencies, right? That's, that's the whole point. I mean, you're, you're denying aseity, you're denying immutability, you're denying omniscience, you're denying omnipresence. You're de- I mean, you're, you're denying basically every single <laughs> uh, attribute attributed to God in, in, in Orthodox classical theism. Right. Uh, so, but, but let me, so let me go back. So uh, looking at, looking at Hebrew, looking at Genesis 18. Hey, Tyler, real quick. You, you, yep. you just said, what did you say? I'm denying Orthodox what? Yeah, you, what? I'm sorry, say that again. You just said I'm denying Orthodox something. What was that? You're, you're denying Orthodox theism. All, all those attributes of, of Orthodox Christianity, right? Where, yeah, where so these I, terms have been well defined, what we mean by yeah, I didn't come here to defend Orthodox theism. I came here to defend the Bible. Right. Well, I'm just going to say that that Orthodox theism just is the proper interpretation of the Bible, right? I mean, and, I mean that's like that's like when if I wanted to appeal to the Westminster Confession and you say, "Well, I don't believe that," I'm just say, "You don't have to." I'm just using it as a as a as a valid summary statement of what I think the Bible teaches, right? So, yeah. um, right, because the the one of the questions that we that we have here is is which which one of us has has aberrant theology compared to orthodox christianity i mean that that's really what we're what we're going for so i, I so i want to go back so so your view is in genesis 18 before i move on to genesis 22 your view is that god not only doesn't know the future that he doesn't know the present that he doesn't know the past and he actually is an omnipresent and he has to go down to the city to find rather than just saying it's anthropomorphic to, to, it, it's it's condescension language, so a transcendent being can be understood by finite humans, which everyone else in, in Christendom is fine with. You're going to say, "I'm going to take it literal, more literal than than anybody in the history of the church ever takes it." Uh, that that literal meaning, therefore, you deny all of these attributes of God. In that example, we have a rare circumstance where God pre-incarnate indwells in bodily form and there's limitations during the incarnation and there's clearly limitations there that is how i interpret that passage do you do the same with genesis 3 when god walks in the garden and calls out to adam and eve to find out where they are no that's a didactic question didactic questions are meant to teach if i know that my son hit a baseball through the window at the house i'm going to bring him into the room and say son what happened i already know what what happened i'm getting Hold on, I'm getting him to admit what he did. That's what's going on in Genesis 3. Where in the verse do you get that? Where, where in the plain meaning does it say that this is a didactic question? It's obvious. They're hiding because they can tell that they're naked. And so God says, where, where are you to admit that, they're, that they've sinned and that they're hiding? If you're going to see that this is, this is the hermeneutical shell game. If you're going to say that it's the plain meaning, if it's the literal meaning, I'm going to ask you, very clearly, what is your hermeneutic? What is what is your exegetical standard for when something is the plain and literal meaning? And it has to be drawn from the text. So you can't just say, well, it's just obvious to me. That, that's not an exegetical or hermeneutical answer, right? I, I, I want to know what is the difference between Genesis 18 on one hand and Genesis 3 on the other, that one of them is, 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 a, is a didactic question. It, it's an anthropomorphic statement of a didactic question and the other one isn't. And what is different in the text? And where in the text can you point to it? What clause shows, what grammar shows that this is a didactic question? The story. The story, the story tells us. They're completely different situations. One of them is a statement or a proclamation from God. The other is a question, which is obvious, like a father does to his child. Okay. I'm content with that answer. I think the audience can can well, understand what I'm saying. That's fine. We can. I mean, I, it's obvious to me isn't isn't a valid answer, but we can move on. So Genesis 22, and, and I'm almost done. I'll let you pepper me with questions too. I just you brought up the two right. big chunk of passages that I brought up. Um, uh, so Genesis 22, right? What does it say? What what does the passage say that God learned? Did, was it was it some future propositional choice of a free creature? What does it say that God learned in Genesis twenty two according to your interpretation? 
Sure. God learned if Abraham would actually follow through. Where, where can you can you read the passage where it says that he learned if Abraham would actually if that's the thing that God learned? Uh, the passage doesn't say that, and I didn't claim that it does. That's just the story. Well, the passage so says. I read it. So the passage says explicitly. So this is. <coughs> I'm not using weird translation. I'm using the NASB, right? It should be acceptable. Um, sure. <clears throat> so it says, do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing. For now I know that you fear God. Yep. What is the thing that he says he now knows in that passage? He now knows that Abraham fears him in a way that he would actually follow through and kill his only son. Did, did he not know that about... so? Did he not know that based on based on First Samuel and based on uh, the Chronicles passage that, that I mentioned earlier, where it says that God knows our hearts immediately. He doesn't know us as men by out Did he not already know that about the heart intentions uh, of Abraham? At what point? Before Abraham started to bring down the knife and the angel had to stop him. Did God not know that about Abraham's heart? Well, how long before? <laughs> Like you, you're, you're talking about the event where he stopped. You, so how, how you, long? Okay, let, me, let me just be direct then. Do you agree with Romans 4 and Hebrews 11 that Abraham had justifying faith all the way back when he believed in the promise of God before Isaac was even born? I do believe that he had faith, yes, back then. That, I think so that's then, referring to Genesis 15. I, I I agree. I think it's referring to the covenant, the promise of the child when they were still old before, before the, the, the child that promised that he'd be a father of many nations. Uh, do, Romans 4 compares that or actually gives that as the paradigmatic example of our justifying faith, right? Does therefore, what sense does it make for God to have, according to the Bible in many passages, God knows our hearts, Right. You've said yep. it before. I've heard you many times. Boyd says it. I mean, a, every open theist agrees that God has perfect knowledge of our hearts. Right. Mm -hmm. You agree. Right. That's that's per present knowledge of, of Abraham's heart at the moment. Uh, it tells us in Romans four and in Hebrews 11 that 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 was the case of Abraham's spiritual condition. He was justified by righteousness, by his faith all the way back in Genesis 15. So are you telling me that by the time we get to Genesis 2, God had forgotten that? Had he lost faith in Abraham? Had he for, did, did, did Abraham suddenly lose faith, even though, even though Romans tells us that he hadn't weakened in his faith that entire time? How is it then in, in Genesis 22 that the thing God learns, if you're saying that this is a, a metaphysically literal statement about God's mind, how is it that God then learns, even though he already knew, Abraham's heart? Abraham started wavering in his faith between Genesis 15 and Genesis 22. Flat out denied by Romans 4. How? Well, well hold on a second. Are you saying the Bible contradicts itself? Because he clearly starts to lose faith in the story between Genesis 15 and Genesis 22. So th this this is actually this is one of the points of, of objection that I have for you, right? So you, for okay. example, you say things like um, a, a timeless God could never repent. Well, I mean, Numbers twenty three tells us expressly that God cannot; He's not a man that He cannot repent. Uh, I mean, that First Samuel fifteen tells us expressly, you know, word for word, that God cannot change His mind. He is not a man that He cannot change His mind. It tells us those things didactically and expressly. Right. So the narratives that have God appearing to change his mind in, in sovereign administration don't contradict those. Your view has it saying, OK, God has changed his mind, even though First Samuel 15 says God can't change his mind because you want them to mean the same thing. And I'm saying they don't mean the same thing. Right. Abraham didn't lose faith in his heart. Romans 4 tells us that he did not become weak in his faith. He did lose faith between Genesis 15 and Genesis 22, which is why he was lying about his own wife, which where God did, was not very he, happy. Where did he lose? How does that show that he lost faith in the promise of God, that he lied about his God. wife? So that they, what, Was the lie because he doubted God's promise, or was the lie so that the, the king, Abimelech, wouldn't take him and kill him? 
the the lie was evident that Abraham did not believe that God's promise that he would have a son with Sarah would come true. Because if if Abimelech Where killed him, there's there's no son. If they take his wife from him, there's no son. Where does that's the, a lie? Where does the text say that it's tied to him him lacking in the promise of God? Maybe he thought that that was providentially he had to. That's how he escaped so that God could bear him a son. Why is that a lack of faith when Romans 4 tells us that he did not become weak in his faith? He uh, contemplated his own body now as good as uh, as good as dead uh, since he was about 100 years old in the deadness of Sarah's womb. Yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God. Sure. Yeah, so men change, right? Uh, he the, the type of faith that got him in the hall of faith was this faith that believed if he killed his son, God would raise him from the dead. That is not the type of faith he had when he's lying about his wife. But again, the lying about the wife is to protect his own life. It has, it has nothing. Paul tells us expressly and explicitly that he grew strong in his faith. He did not waver in unbelief and gave glory to God. Paul says that expressly. You're saying now Paul is wrong and you are right because you need that to be true to defend your interpretation. No, not so at all. Paul, do, you, do you take a do you claim to take a literal literal reading? Do you take a literal reading of Romans 4 verse 20 where it says expressly, yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God being fully assured that what God had promised he would be able to perform. Do you so take that literally? Paul, Paul here is referring back to a certain point in time in Abraham's life where that was true. He's not where, saying where, from, where get that he's not saying from his entire life. I'm not asking about his entire life. I, I'm talking about his faith in the one promise of God that was credited to him as righteousness, the promise that he would be the father of many nations. That's what this is referring to. It says it expressly in verse 18. That's all we're yeah. talking about. <laughs> right. At, at one point, what, Abraham had what, what God says that he learned about his heart in Genesis 22, that, 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 you, that you have trusted me and you have not withheld your son, your only son. You have you have shown you have faith in the promise that this is the son, the, the son of promise, the son that I will give you. Yeah, yeah. Abraham passed the test. But did and God not, way, for, did God not know that about his heart before the test? If he's never got if he didn't grow weak in unbelief, he drew stronger in his faith, giving glory to God and being fully assured that what God had promised he would perform. Did God not already know that? He already knew it, say, what, while they were walking up the mountain, and he chose to stop him when he actually raised the knife. But you won't tell me he when you're referring to did God know. He didn't know, the day, he didn't know that about the heart of Abraham the day before that? He may have, but the reality is we're human beings, and it's one thing to know or think that you will do something. It's another to actually do it when you have to follow through. So are you By the altering way, your definition? understanding of God based on our being changeable. So you're, so you're exegeting God based on an understanding of fallible humans. No, I'm, I'm, I'm acknowledging that we're made in God's image. And it's, I think it's clear to people that it's one thing to believe or think you will do something in a situation. It's another to actually follow through. So Can what do you I, think first Samuel 15 means when it says that he is not a man that he should change his mind? The, the didactic sure. statement, right? Right, right, right. What you're, you're exemplifying perfectly, what I said, is that you're taking narratival inferences. And when I take you to Romans, you get wishy-washy because you're backwards. You're, you're taking your narratives hyper-literally and you're wishy-washy on the didactic, right? So you go to your narratives, God changes his mind. But then when you go to one where it says, and the glory of Israel would not lie or change his mind, for he is not a man that he should change his mind. You get wishy-washy on that. But you say, well, we're made in the image of God and we change our mind. So therefore, God must be able to change his mind. Your hermeneutics is backwards. Okay, so I didn't bring up those passages I'll, and I'll, I'm not I'll, wishing. I'll, I'll, no, no, I'll this stop. is great. You can, you can question me. I'll, I'll stop. I, I talk a lot. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. I want to respond to this first and then I'll ask you some questions. So sure, two, two, issues, two issues. Number one, 
you keep saying that I prioritize narratives. That's exactly what you're doing with Numbers 23, 19 and 1 Samuel 15. So you're being hypocritical. I, I'm not at all. I, I, I'm pointing to the didactic statements uh, that are presented about the, they're, 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 they are, they are not narrative inferences, right? I'm, I'm not saying, okay, well, it says that God went down there and he learned something. And so therefore I need to draw an inference about the metaphysics, the ontology of the nature of God, right? This is a express statement about the nature of God, right? It's saying he's not a man that he should change his mind. He doesn't lie. He cannot lie. He does not repent, right? These are, these are, Third, these are these are you know omniscient third person omniscient narrator saying expressly the theological inferences that we should take. We're not reading a narrative and then drawing our own inferences about the ontology of God. You see the difference okay, between so those two things. In First Samuel fifteen, and I don't know why, but Calvinists mm -hmm. always like to look this out. It says God it's repents perfect. twice. Perfect. Let's look at it. In a span of 18 verses, the exact mm -hmm. same story, the exact same narrative, it says God yep. repents twice, and it says he doesn't repent once. I will posit to you right now, only the open theist has a consistent hermeneutic in this story. And the consistency is this. When it says God repents, it means he repents. What, is, what did he repent of? He repented of setting up Saul as king. When it says he doesn't repent, that also means he doesn't repent. What is he not going to repent of? taking it away from Saul. They're both true. You're taking no. one and saying the others. No, no, no. So here, here's the, uh, it's what, I, what I'm saying is in the narrative, when we make a narrative enter, enter, what's happening is you have God doing something in the narrative. Whenever God is acting in time, and we can get to your timeless statements, whenever God is acting in time, there's anthropomorphism happening. God, God is incarnational. God is condescending to us. We don't under, we couldn't understand what God is doing providentially unless we understand it looks like God is doing one thing and establishing Saul, but he's decreed that something else is going to take place because of the sinfulness of Saul. And so it looks like a change of mind. That's just providentially how things are outworking. But the didactic statement says, but then the didactic statement comes in and, and clarifies and says, but don't think that God, that Yahweh is like a man, that he should lie or change his mind. And it gives two things, right? So, so you want to say, okay, well, it's talking specifically about establishing the throne and taking away the throne. The problem is, is it doesn't tie it to those things. And it gives analogies to lying in both cases, in Numbers 23 and in 1 Samuel 15. It reads, quote, so Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to your neighbor who is better than you. Also, the glory of Israel will not lie or change his mind, for he is not a man that he should change his mind. Right? So the, 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 the direct didactic statement, right? It's not an inference that's being made by us about a narrative action of God. It's saying expressly, God, Yahweh, is not like a man. How do we know that? Because he doesn't lie and he doesn't change his mind. So when we see what's happening, when it looks like God is relenting or repenting, it's God is providentially moving history through time. It's not actually meant to draw an ontological belief about the nature of God. The didactic statement tells us that. Yeah, you're, you're, you're referring to the words of Samuel to Saul, and you're ignoring the words of God in verse 11. Now the word of the Lord came to Samuel saying, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king, for he has turned back mm -hmm. from following me and has not performed my commandments. You're you correct. can't take that because then your theology falls. Uh, I can take it literally because I take it, taking something literally, uh, again, this is why I say open theists are terrible at hermeneutics, right? Taking something literally doesn't mean you take it woodenly literally. It means you take it literarily. You take it as the sense is intended by the author, right? That's the grammatical historical method, right? So God's when you read this, who do, so who do you think is talking to Saul? No one's talking to Saul. I read a verse where God is speaking to Samuel, and it's, and it's the words of God. He says that he regrets setting up Saul as king. How do you take that literally with your theology? Right. 
I take it the same way that we all take Genesis 3, the same way everyone historically, except for open theists in, in the 20th century, understand all of these passages. They're anthropomorphic descriptions about God working providentially in time. Because when you go to the didactic statements, it tells us expressly, for he is not a man that he should change his mind. So here's my question for you, because the, the, you said a Calvinist can't be consistent. We actually can, because we understand one is anthropomorphic and we understand one is a didactic statement. You understand them as identical concepts. So if you understand them as identical concepts, you have God saying, I regret. You have Samuel saying, God is not a man that he should regret. How is that not a direct contradiction? Because they are ident on your view, they are identical concepts. One says X. One says not X. How is that not a contradiction? Yeah, they're, they're referring to different things. Verse 11 is specifically saying that God repents of setting up Saul as king. And verse 29, Samuel is telling Saul that God is not going to change his mind about removing the kingdom from him. He's not saying he doesn't change his mind about that thing. He says he's not a man that he should change his mind. Right, Like he, a man. He doesn't be like a man. He's, he's not a man. He doesn't, right. and he ties, he ties it to lying, right? For the same reason, God is not like a man. That's why he doesn't lie and we can trust him. He's not like a man that he doesn't re repent, that he doesn't change his mind, right? It puts those two yeah. things together, right? You're divorcing those two things. So you're saying conceptually they're the same, right? The context doesn't say one of the, it doesn't say that he's, that he's a man that he shouldn't lie or change his mind about this one historical event. Right. It says that he should not lie or change his mind for he is not a man. This is an ontological statement about God's nature, not this specific incident. He is not a man that he should change his mind. God changes sure, his mind. So God does change his mind. Which one of these Bible passages is true to you? I'm going to answer and then I'm going to start asking you questions before we run out of time. So right. the Bible says the Bible says 26 times that God repents. Jonah says God repents. God says out of his own mouth that he repents. So I therefore believe God repents. And I think I've explained the two instances we have where God says he doesn't repent are very specific to what is going on in those stories. So now I'm going to ask you some questions. Did I miss it? Says, it I, God is a mother, by the way. So let's, okay. if so, you don't take it literally, anyways. Did I miss it? I paid attention to your opening statement and I've been listening clearly in this cross-examination and I took a lot of notes. I didn't hear you ever make one single argument from the Bible that God knows the future. Yeah, so I so I said it in my very opening statement. I said that I'm actually going to do this by um, an internal critique of the negative position, right? If the negative position is false, the positive position is true. I could, I, I mean, I, I would be happy to go through some of the passages, uh, some you know, Isaiah 46, Isaiah 42, John 3, Job 37, the Psalm 139, where it says that he knows every word of our mouths before it's on our lips, right? I mean, I, I could go through all of these passages where he declares the ends uh, from the beginning, right? I, I could go through all of these passages where it talks about God has so, that. But my whole point was not only is that true, your position is entirely false and hermeneutically unsound. Okay, so um, the verses that you just mentioned that you said you could do, a lot of people listening might think that those actually might show that God knows the future, but they don't. What you've done a really good job tonight is, uh, is showing that God has present knowledge. For example, in your opening statement, you said there's a verse that says God knows all things in heaven above and on earth below. Number one, I don't know what verse you're referring to. I don't know if you know off the top of your head. And number two, that's present knowledge. So I feel like you've defended present knowledge, but you haven't even attempted to defend future knowledge, which is what we're debating. Uh, so, so, for example, Psalm 139.4, he knows every word before it's even on our lips. Right. Is that. Yeah, it, so is, that's is that statement that he knows it before is that future knowledge of a free will choice. I choose my words. Yeah. Right. Yeah. This is great. Do, do I, do I, God, my yeah. This is present knowledge. So before okay, we let's, speak, let's, Hey Tyler, before we speak, yeah. we think in our mind what we're going to say. And so it starts Something. in our mind before it, get, before it gets to our tongue. If, if this verse said, uh, before Where you were conceived, 
I know what you're going to say as an adult, then yeah, that would falsify my position. But this is present knowledge. Okay, so uh, what? Well, that's iffy, right? You're reading you're reading that into the into the passage, right? So uh, it, it says, uh, let's see, uh, one. Th- uh, you scrutinize my path, my lying down, or intimately equated my ways, even before there is a word on my tongue. Behold, you, O Lord, know all of it. Um, yep, I agree. I, I, I'm not sure you do. Well, especially since you deny in lots of other passages uh, that God even knows present or, or past things. Um, but if, if we look through, right, one, th- one uh, verse 5. You have enclosed me behind and before. You've laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's too high. I cannot attain it. Right. It, if God knows it, the the split second, he only knows it a millisecond before I say it. Right. I'm not sitting here for a minute pondering what I'm going to say. And then it comes out. Right. My opening statement I did. But right now I'm not. I'm my my words are almost present with what's happening in my mind. Right. Sure. God knowing a fraction of a second before I speak. Is that really such knowledge that's too wonderful for me? It's too high. I cannot attain to it. Twins do this. Only... I can finish no, the no. sentence for my wife. <laughs> I know what my wife is going to say before she says it sometimes. D- is that knowledge too high? It's too, it's too wonderful. It's too, I cannot attain to it, even though I can attain to it with my wife. You can't attain to it to your wife. That's, that's, that's a good try. Um, only God can know hearts and minds and souls. So yes, this is I, knowledge that's too wonderful to comprehend. I've finished my wife's sentences many times. I've spoken before she because I know her so well. Right. Do that, you finish? That, that is, you, do you finish her future sentences that are that she's going to say next week? Because that would that uh, would be what you need to. Show. No, not not really. All, all we're saying is any type of future knowledge, right? And you're you're saying yeah. he knows it because it's in our brain before we speak it, right? That's a fraction of right. a millisecond before that happens, right? I can do right. that. I can do that fraction of a millisecond. My, if that's your exegesis of the passage, but but we can we can keep going. Right. Uh, Psalm, uh, the same Psalm, right. Verse, verse seven, where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee your presence? If I send to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol behind, you are there. If I take wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest parts of the sea, even there, your hand will lead me. Right. It's going through all these omniscience. It's, it's comparing on knowledge to omniscience because it ties it all together. In verse 16, it says, your eyes have seen my unformed substance and in your book, were all written past tense the writing is in the past tense the days that were ordained for me when as of yet there was not one of them yeah did god we look i don't think there's actually like a a bill fold up in heaven right book book clearly means that right it's not talking about a book but all of that was known and penned before his unformed substance before he was born and formed in the womb, yep. right? What is your unformed substance before your womb? The days that were ordained for him when there was yet not one. Tomorrow, for answer? example. Well, hold on. Can let I me answer? Finish, let me finish the thought before you answer, right? Okay, great. If God had penned that I would live to 75, right? Could I surprise him and commit suicide tomorrow? Well, God doesn't pen when people are going to live, die, when they're going to sin, when they're going to murder, really? when they're going to, even though that's your the Bible, theology. The Bible, the Bible doesn't say that he chooses the days of our lives? Let me answer this passage. You're not giving me a chance to answer. You're, you're kind of monopolizing the time here. Verses 13 through 16 of Psalm 139 are all about fetology, and they're all about the days in the womb and the process that God created for life in the womb. Every single word in in that passage is about that. For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret, referring to life in the womb, and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Figure of speech for the womb. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, again, the embryo. And in your book, they were all written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. This is all about fetology. You take the last two sentences of this passage, rip it out of context, and say it has to do with everything we're ever going to do in our life, when it's clearly just about nine months in the womb. Well, what I would 
push back on two things. One, it being fetology doesn't matter, right? Because how many, how many, as we live in a fallen world, how many fetals, how many, how many, how many fetuses are, are murdered in the womb? A lot, too many. Does God write all the days in advance? Can, can God write, let's say there's a, I have a coworker who's pregnant right now. Does God write all of the days that are as yet formed if my coworker could decide later tonight without me knowing to get an abortion? This is referring does to God the blueprint. The, does God know the future? It's referring to the blueprint. What, what, what blueprint of my body is the days that were ordained for me? What does ordained mean? Well, I guess we'd have to look at different translations. Mine says fashioned, but what this means is that is that God created the system where someone goes from fertilization all the way to birth. Those are the days that he fashioned for people while we're in the womb. This never says anything about anybody's life after they're born. Except the rest of the psalm does. The rest of the psalm is about where he can go. How precious are also are your thoughts about when he wakes that's, up and when he's with it, right? That's, I mean, again, I, I, Tyler, you're just not doing that's, the literal. You're not being literal, that's, like you say you are. Knowledge. I agree with all of those. Is their present knowledge? Okay, uh, you brought up Isaiah. Well, sorry, you're, it's your turn to keep asking. You're, I'm sorry. Yeah, great. So, um, my what the reason I became an open theist was because I believe God is free. If God is free, the future must be open. Can you refute that? Can you? Well, I don't have to refute it. That's yours. So this is like your, your entire opening thesis did this, right? This is why I said I wasn't really impressed because your entire opening thesis, you would say things like, well, a God who's timeless can't move over the face of the waters. Okay, so hold on. Let's deal with it. I believe, I believe since God is free, the future must be open. Because if the future is settled, it's settled for God, and therefore God is not free. So I, I'm that's positing a, right now, that's a in, your, in your view, God is not free because you believe the future is settled even for him. So it, I, I actually don't need to respond because your statement's a non sequitur, right? Your, your argument is, if God is timeless, therefore he's not free. God is timeless. God is not timeless, therefore he's not free. It's a non sequitur. I didn't, I didn't say that. I, I did not use. I okay, did not so, say that. So, let's, so here's let's do the syllogism in your of the view. Argument. In your okay, view, you guys are you, you guys are talking over each other. Let's try to give time to respond and answer questions. Great, Tyler. In your view, God's own future is settled, and He doesn't even have the free will to change His own future. Which the, so. The, you, you comment, I, I, you know, I've watched all your debates. You do this, right? You don't, you don't understand the position because you, you're thinking of God in temporal terms, right? So you're, you're, what you're saying is given that God is temporal on your view, God can't, God, God, his future is settled, right? On a Calvinist view, God doesn't have a future. God is a temporal, right? So your, your challenge is like me saying how heavy is the color green seven, right? It's, it's a meaningless question because you're saying, if I assume that God is temporal, then on your atemporal view, tell me about his temporal future. And I'm just gonna say, well, the question is meaningless. Okay, great. So I, I understand what you're saying. And so let's do this. The incarnation proves that God is temporal. That you is cannot true. become a man. You cannot become a man if you're atemporal. Why not? You cannot. You cannot take on a human nature if you're atemporal. That is sequence. You can't have sequence if you're atemporal. So, so this, this, you also have this common problem. Sequence is not necessarily chronological, right? You can have logical sequencing without any type of, of, of chronology to it, right? We, I, we can have, you, can have, you can have se sequential progression. You can have logical progression without having temporal okay, progression. Let, let me tell you what I mean when I say sequence. I mean a past and a present and a future, I mean a before and an after. Do you believe God has a past? Uh, do, when, when you say believe God, because you make this mistake also where you confuse the divine nature with the person, right? So do you mean that the divine nature has a past? No, do, do you believe God has a past? You mean the divine nature 
has a temporal past. Is that what you're asking? God, the person. Does God, the person, have a past? God is not a person. God, God's the nature. The persons are the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Are you a Trinitarian? Yeah. So God is okay, a person, so right? The three persons. So the three persons. So, so you. No, no, no. God, God. That would be a flat-out contradiction to say God. There is God, one person, God, and three persons: Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That's a contradiction, right? There's there's three persons and there's one being, right? There's one what? There's one divine being and there's three persons. God. Does God the Son so have a past? Asking, so does God? The, does the person of the Son have a past? Yeah. Does God the Son have a past? Uh, God in time after creation has a has a logical sequence yes the nature the triune god does not because the triune god is atemporal okay do you believe god the son has one nature or two uh god has god the son presently yes two You're proving my he, point he is here. eternally enthroned in heaven uh as as the incarnate son do you believe God the Son existed at some point with only one nature? Uh, yes. He's, and okay, so you, he exists. you just acknowledge that God is temporal and that God the Son no, has a past. No, I didn't. You need to draw that inference out. You, you, this is what you can't do. This is what you keep trying to do. You keep trying to say, if you affirm, and you do this in all your debates, I can affirm that God the triune God, the divine nature. So when, when, when Orthodox Christians talk about the Trinity, right? We start with the unity of the Godhead first. Unity grounds the diversity, right? This is basic Trinitarian theology, right? The divine nature is timeless, right? So when you ask, does the Son, the person of the Son, have a, ha, take on a second nature, I can say, yes, absolutely he did. And you're going to say, oh, that's, but that means he's temporal. That's and I'm going to say, but that's not temporality. That doesn't happen. Here's you, have, you need to, here's why you need, you, heard it, you need to demonstrate it. Sure. I can demonstrate it just by what you admitted. You admitted that God, the son once existed with only one nature, but presently he exists with two natures. That means he has I, a past and he's in time. No, I also believe that God created, God existed prior. That's a, that's the term. They're, they're messy terms, right? I believe that God existed prior to creation, right? That's not that messy doesn't, because he's temporal. That doesn't, that doesn't commit me to believing that God is temporal. God is logically prior to his creation. Here's right? the problem is that everybody, 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 let me show why this is an issue. Do you agree that the Kalam cosmological argument is a good argument for God? I am not prepared to talk about that for a debate that's about the future and not the Kalam cosmos cosmological okay. argument. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna show a reason. There, there, this is going somewhere, right? Do you, just Jen, are you familiar with the Kalam cosmological argument? I am familiar, but I feel like you're obfuscating here and and killing our I'm, time. I'm not. But I, I, there, I, I'm asking this for a very specific reason, because anyone who believes that the Kalam is a good argument cannot agree with what you just said. Because, and let me, let, rather than go into the other questions, let me show, let me tell you why. Because the main demonstration for the premise that, that the universe existed in the finite past is what's called the impossibility of an actually infinite set of events, Right? You cannot have an actually infinite set of events. It entails all kinds of contradictions, right? So if that's the case, you cannot have an eternal God because that would be the exact same problems that you have for an eternal cosmos. So you need to pick one. Is God time bound or is God the creator of a finite universe? You don't get to have both. So which yeah, one you is can it have both. Is, God time, is God time bound or is the, the creator of the universe? Getting back to what we were talking about, the incarnation shows that God is in time. It doesn't, sh and it you, doesn't and show you. It. You, even, 
You even asked me when I asked if God the Son has two natures, you even asked me, do you mean presently? Even you recognize that he has a past, a present, and a future, which yeah. is completely antithetical to atemporality. And, and I told you, it's exa- I mean exactly the same thing by that, that I mean when I say that God existed before creation, even though, and this is actually a different question for you, because, well, even though I think that time is a dimension of creation, right? Time, 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 isn't, time is a dimension of space, right? It's a, it's a fourth dimension of space in creation. So when you say God is time, God is time bound before creation, I don't even know what you mean by that. Right. It's, it's like it's like when the atheist brings up the flying spaghetti monster that's neither flying nor spaghetti nor a monster. It just becomes a, an amorphous concept. When you say God is time bound before creation, but time just is a dimension of creation. I don't know what you mean. You're redefining terms like you do with omniscience and omnipresence and all these other terms. So what do you even I mean never, when you say that God is time bound? I never said he was time bound. You, you said he's not timeless. So is God bound to time? Is God bound to time? Time is a an aspect of reality. You're acting like it's this thing that we can play with and test and look at, and it's not. Did God create time? No, I said that in my opening statement. The Bible never says he he created time. time. So he is subject to time. Time Time is an aspect of reality. You're still talking over each other. Let's try to uh, allow... Uh, answer and response. What do you mean yeah, when you say is, time is an aspect of reality? It's like the laws of logic, right? Do you believe the laws of logic were created by God? I think, yeah, uh, I think act- the laws. I think the laws of logic are a reflection of the structure of the mind of God. They are part of God. Yeah, exactly, and and so and so is time. So is duration. So is forward sequence. Because God exists in duration, the rest of the universe exists in duration. It's the exact same thing. It's not the same. Because God doesn't exist in the laws of logic. The laws of logic are an expression of the mind of God. You're saying God exists in time. He's bound to time. He exists in tense. Right? So that means that there is a reality in which God lives. God then is not the ultimate reality, whatever this tensed reality is, and God lives in it. Are you familiar with presentism? I, I am familiar with presentism. So that should answer your question. I'm a presentist. And the very basic definition of presentism is that the present is the only thing that exists and the present is the only thing that has ever existed. I, I understand. I'm not asking about, about the, which tense exists, whether it's the present tense or the past tense or all tense. I'm not asking that. I'm asking when you say God exists in time, what does that mean? I know what it means to say you and I exist in time because we exist in extensions of space time as material beings. Right? Do you believe that God is a material being physically located somewhere before creation? No, that's a straw man, obviously. Never well, said that. I'm Don't just, believe that. So, 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 right, so it's not physicality. It's not space time. It's not extension into space and time. So when you say God exists in time, what is it that he's existing in? What is that reality that is more foundational than God that he has to live in it? What it means is, is that God, uh, for example, before he created anything, uh, would think and act in sequence, would converse with the... You can have logical sequence without chronological sequence. That's why I said there's no problem with God thinking and acting in logical sequence prior to creation. You're shoving shoving temporality into that, right? That's why I'm saying you need to prove that. You can't just assert it. Well, I did. I started with Genesis 1-1 and I went to Revelation. You're the only, I, I hope you realize this, Tyler, you're not really showing that the Bible teaches that God knows the future. You're talking about what? cosmological I, I, arguments. I, I, you're talking example. about all that. Yeah, I mean, I've shown multiple, again, I, I figured that most people have done all these debates over and over again, right? So, I mean, I, for example, we can go to the, to the, to the chess of the, of the false idols in Isaiah. 
where one of the tests of the false idols is if they are able to look at the past and declare the future that came from them, right? That's that's yeah. one of the tests. One of the things that makes God God is when he says that he will declare the ends from the beginning, right? That's one of the things where it says, I'm a true God because I know future events and I can declare the ends from the beginning, right? I, I can, I can right. uh, so see the former things have taken place and the new things I declare before they spring into being, I announce them to you, right? That's Isaiah 42. I mean, I could, I, I could go to tons of these passages where it talks about God knows everything. I can talk about in Ephesians 1 where it says that he predestined to us adoptions from before the foundations of the world. And go to Revelation 13 where it says that the names of those who are redeemed had their names written from the foundations of the world. Right? I mean, there's, there's all kinds of passages that we could do to show that. Can I respond? Sure. Great. So... You, you throw out a lot of scripture and it becomes difficult to track it and to respond. So let me respond to at least two things that you just said. When Calvinists bring up the names written in the book of life, they always ignore uh, names being blotted out. And I think that that's a little disingenuous. Uh, we don't actually. It, it, I, I, have, okay. I, have, uh, I have articles on this and I've, and I've actually addressed it. Right. So in, in okay. Revelation, it's, it's actually in the form of the negative. Your name will never be blotted out. Right. It, it's a promise to those who, to, to the overcomers, which, by the way, John wrote the, the John wrote Revelation. He also wrote First John, which says that all those who are born of God will overcome. So when you get into Revelation three, where it talks about your names are written in the Lamb's book of life and they will never be blotted out. It's a promise to the elect that you are secure pure in Christ and will not lose your salvation. Your names will never be blotted out because they've been there since the foundations of time. Right. So, so I'm not, they're, I'm not ignoring that. If you're going to go to the old yeah, Testament, the old Testament reference to the, to the, the, the book of life is actually dealing with when someone lives and dies. It's not the same reference as the lamb's book of life dealing with the overcomers uh, who, who have their, have their new name written in the book, right? You're dealing with two different concepts. Possibly, we'd have to debate that, which we don't have time to do. So let me respond to Isaiah. Bring it up. <laughs> let, let me respond to Isaiah. I, I've yet to meet. I want to make two points about Isaiah. I've yet to meet a Calvinist that is consistent about his interpretation of of these verses. Um, in the exact context that you bring up, where God is giving a test for these false idols to declare what will happen or talk about the past. He also asks them to do good or evil. Is there a reason that I can't find a consistent Calvinist to then argue, well, then that means God also does evil? Uh, for the, you're simply misunderstanding the Hebrew. I, 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 what it's actually pointing to is these are, these are wooden idols. They're false. They can't do anything. They can't bring about uh, good or the, the word for evil is translated. It's calamity. They, they can't bring about peace or war. They can't bring about uh, shalom or exile. They can't bring about uh, exile or return. They can, I mean, this is, this is why throughout the prophets, God is described as being one, the one who brings about Ra, who brings about evil, calamity. He's the one that brings Assyria and Babylon in to destroy the people, right, for their, for their faithlessness. So, That's bringing about calamity. It's, it's not saying that God can do evil, sinful things. It's saying, can, can these things of wood and stone do anything? Can, can they establish a nation? Can they overthrow a nation? Can they bring about good or calamity? No, they cannot. I'm going to take a stab here that I might regret, and I wish I knew Hebrew, but I don't. But I have a feeling that you might have just said that, and that the actual Hebrew word is, is evil and not calamity. So I'm hoping somebody watching, whether they're on my side or your side, or just watching that knows Hebrew what, can bring this actual, up in the Q and A. I can bring it up right now. Uh, what, but what, the second thing I want to I want to I want to bring up though, because I really want to respond to this, is open theists believe God can declare the future and bring it to pass. So this doesn't prove for you that God knows the future. And in this context, in the exact verses that you are reading, God says. In Isaiah 46, 11, which is Isaiah 46, 10 is what you mentioned, declaring the end from the beginning. He says in verse 11, indeed, I have spoken it. I also will bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will also do it. 
He never claims that he has knowledge of the future. He says when he declares something, he will use his power to bring it to pass. Okay, how, how is that the case if I can freely thwart his will? How, what, what does God do to bring it about? Does he, do, if, 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 he, if he has declared, for example, uh, he, you know, be, from before, before he was born, he called, uh, he called Jeremiah. From, from within the womb, he called Paul, right? Could they have rejected that? Are they free to reject sure. that? So sure. then how does God have it? So this is what I'm saying. The open theist, you can say you affirm this all you want, but your system doesn't all actually allow you to affirm this because you want to so idolize libertarian freedom that any human decision is more sovereign than anything that God can say he purposes because we can always just choose to do otherwise. So unless, unless you want to say that God just Nebuchadnezzar's all of us to get what he wants, right? How is it on your view that God can fulfill his purpose for, how, how could God fulfill his purpose for me if he didn't even know I existed? Are you, I, I don't understand that argument. I, no, no one, no one's made an argument and I, including you, that God had a purpose for somebody before they existed. By the way, that would falsify my position, but you're not bringing these things up. So would, two things. God has a way of dealing with people who don't want to cooperate. The Bible says that he puts hooks in the jaws of Gog and Magog. Um, he, he muted the, John the Baptist's father until he would agree to name him what God wanted to name him. So God is omnicompetent. Um, he doesn't need to know the future in order to declare it and make things come to pass. In my view, open theism is actually making God greater. Uh, you guys believe God can tell the future because he peeked into the, to a crystal ball. We're saying, no, God is so wise. He is, he is so competent that he can say something will happen and bring it to pass. Where, where, so, well, a couple of things. Uh, one, again, you've already admitted that our free will decisions can trump that. So no, we don't. And where have I ever said that God peeks into a crystal ball to know something? Can you can you cite anything that I've written or said or debated or anything here where I've said anything remotely like that? I was speaking generally about Christians who say that God knows the future because he can see it because he's outside of time. That's what I was referring to. It wasn't you so, specifically. Can, can you, well, you said me specifically, but can you, can you say, can you show me any Calvinist, any reform scholar, any reformed Arminian? Can you show me any Molinist who says that God learns these things by peeking into a crystal ball? So I was using a figure of speech to explain this view that God knows the future because he can see it. That is the equivalent, Tyler, of somebody watching a movie and then predicting the end. But again, that's, okay. I'm, I'm trying to take you literally. I'm trying to take the plain meaning of what you say, right? Because let's, let's, right. let's all be consistent, right? Where has any Calvinist, any Reformed, any Reformed Arminian, in any type of theologically robust Protestant, any type of, 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 uh, of Augustinian, any type of anyone who follows Aquinas, any type of theologically robust Orthodox Christian said anything remotely like that general statement. Can you cite me one? Okay, so Tyler, I feel like you're not listening to me. What I said was, is I came up with a figure of speech to explain the view that most Christians hold, which is that God knows the future because he sits outside of time and looks at it. The, the, the wording I used was looking into a crystal ball, but that's the reality of what they believe. Okay, and I'm asking you for any citation of any Calvinist, Reformed, uh, Reformed, uh, uh, you know, Calvinist, Reformed Baptist, of any Reformed Arminian, of any Molinist, of any Augustinian, of anyone who follows a quote. Can you find me a quote where it is by looking at a crystal ball, not literally a crystal ball, I understand that you're using a figure of speech, where that is the modus operandi. You're saying it's an accurate description of how we all believe that God gains knowledge of the future, right? I don't know I mean, I anybody who believes that, 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 that God gets knowledge of the future. In fact, I don't know anyone in these groups that thinks that God attains knowledge. That's not, om okay, hold that's on. not omniscience. 
okay, what, how, what, what method do Arminians say God gets his knowledge of the future? Uh, it depends on which Arminian you talk to. You can have a Molinist Arminian. You can have someone who's a little bit more Augustinian. It depends yeah. who you talk to. But none of that, they are all going to say that God is omniscient innately, immutably by his aseity, that by his perfections. It's not that God is without knowledge, looks down the corridors of time. That's actually, a, that. that's, I rebuke my own Calvinists when they say that about Arminians, because that's not how they actually view God gets knowledge, because they don't believe God attains knowledge. So None what is the difference between that God attains knowledge? What is the difference between Calvinism and Arminianism when it comes to God's foreknowledge? When it comes to God's foreknowledge, the difference is the, the Calvinist is going to base the knowledge of God on his own sovereign decrees. God has decreed what will come to pass. His, 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 uh, uh, his free knowledge is grounded on his natural knowledge. The Arminian is simply, my, uh, to be honest, I think that they affirm something without grounding. That's why there's a grounding objection. They're going to affirm that God has this knowledge and that he has it without attainment. There's no, there's no process of attainment that they say God, that God grants it, right? The problem is, and where I disagree with them, and if you were an Arminian, I'd be pushed back and I'd say, okay, the problem is you have no grounding for that. That's the exact problem, I think, with Arminianism and with Molinism is that they don't ground it in anything. But that's what they believe. So when you say your understanding of all of these views are that they're, that God is attaining knowledge, I'm just going to point out, well, then you're just demonstrating that you don't understand these views. And it's not. I'm not just saying you don't understand Calvinism. At that point, I'm saying you don't understand Arminianism, Molinism, Roman Catholicism, Wesleyanism, Eastern Orthodox. I mean, none of these views have God attaining knowledge in any way. Uh, any final response to that, Will? Yes. Huh. Um, I, I didn't come here to defend other views. I just came here to defend, does the Bible teach that God knows the future? So there we go. All right. So we are now transitioning to our Q&A portion of this debate, and we have a whole bunch of questions for you. Um, first, I want to get my super chats in. All right. This is Spartan Theology. Thank you for the super chat. Spartan Theology. Appreciate you. Duffy. Can God make a mistake? I wish they would have uh, defined mistake, uh, but I would say no. What happens is, is God deals with fallen human beings. Fallen human beings oftentimes um, disappoint God and um, don't do what he wishes they would do. So can God make mistakes? No. Do his people make mistakes all the time? Can I, can I clarify uh, what I think he means? Go ahead, Tyler. And if Steve Will can answer. I think what he means, if I could, if I could point it, and, and maybe Spartan can clarify, is can God try to do something? Can he, can he try to bring something about and fail to do it? Are you, are you talking about with a free will human being in the mix? Yep. So we have a biblical example of this. So, so I, I would hope you would appreciate that. God wanted Moses to speak to Pharaoh. And God tried to convince Moses to speak to Pharaoh by saying, I will put the words on your tongue. And Moses refused. And God said, fine, I'll just use Aaron, your brother, instead. All right. Another yeah, I don't think it, I don't think it was a mistake. So anyway, keep going. All right. Another super chat, Spartan Theology. Thank you once again. Another $1.99. Duffy, does God know the past? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Except when he chooses not to. Except when he comes in bodily form and is limited in his knowledge and his presence. So, for example, Jesus said that he does not know the day or the hour of his return. Do you, I, I actually, I can't, a follow-up question on that. You, you say you're a Trinitarian. Do you, I mean, do you, do you affirm the hypostatic union? Yes, it proves my position. It proves my theology that God is temporal. Okay, so do you believe that, that the divine nature didn't know 
the day and the hour that the sun would return? Or was he t speaking to his humanity that he didn't know their the day and the hour? Okay, so natures don't contain knowledge, only persons do. There's only one second person of the Trinity. And the order that Jesus gives in the verse is father, son, man. Uh, actually, father, son, angels, man. And so he actually elevates himself uh, to where before he was made below the angels. So he puts himself right after the father. Most people miss that order in that verse. Well, it's, I mean, you just, you just basically stated the Apollinarian heresy. So anyways, not sure what that All is. Right. You, you should, Next you should question. look it up. <laughs> All right. Uh, let me get a question for Tyler, man. We'll start getting beat up with these questions a little bit. Tyler, first right. Samuel 15, 11, I greatly regret that I've set up Saul as king. If God determined Saul's action, why would he regret his own actions? Yeah, so uh, uh, two things on this. Um, there's a common misunderstanding about determinism uh, that, that just because God has determined everything that therefore God directly causes all things, right? Which I think is, is uh, revealed in this question. The, the, the issue here is that the, what we talked about earlier where the Bible speaks with anthropomorphic language when it speaks about God. Right. It's not when it talks about regret, right? The word here for regret doesn't mean like, oh, woe is me, like, oh, I'm so bummed. Right. It's that that's not what it means. Right. Re regret here means that he relented, that he's changing courses, that he's changing directions, that that he has established something and that he regrets, he he regrets the the that that it was set up and it's going to change course now. Right? So you're dealing with anthropomorphic language. This is why I pointed out that we, the question wants to draw an inference from a narrative statement that isn't, that isn't directly stating about the ontology of God when within the same passage we're told that God is not a man that he would regret. Right? So if you hold those as the same concept, you have to say the scripture contradicts each other. If you hold them as different concepts, there's no contradiction. If one of them is, is anthropomorphic and one of them is a direct statement about the ontology, there's no contradiction. Any thoughts, Will? Uh, we covered that in the debate. So I, I, I do believe it means what it says. So do I. All right, next question. Yeah, that's it. All right, this was for you, Will. How did God know the prophecy about King Cyrus by name before Cyrus was born? Yeah, it's a great question. <laughs> so from an open theist perspective, um, what we have to figure out is if God has the ability to get parents to name their child a specific name. And I mentioned this briefly during the debate in Luke 1, um, verse 13, it says this, but the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you shall call his name John. Zacharias was told by an angel of the Lord to call his name John. He lost faith and was muted and he did not get his voice back until he wrote physically, his name is John. So God is powerful. He is wise. He is omnicompetent and it's very easy for him to get someone to name someone something. Obviously, Mary uh, obliged and named her son Jesus, as was commanded. Any thoughts, Tyler? Yeah, I would just I would just say at that point. I mean, that that's nice platitudes, but if if Will's position is right, uh, then Mary could have you know she's commanded by God to name him uh, to name him uh, Yeshua, but she could have named him Yaakov if she wanted to because she could have freely. No, Nothing about that says how God accomplished his, his plan, how God could have predicted it, because Mary and Joseph at any time could have freely said, well, you know, we don't want to do that. There's also no evidence that that happened with King Cyrus. There we have no narrative of, of God coming in, in, you know, in, in Shekinah glory or an angel to the parents of Cyrus and saying, name your son Cyrus. Like that, we have no evidence of that. So uh, it's, there's just, it's a nice platitude, but I, I, I I don't think it actually works on his system. 
Yeah, my, my point is simply that God can do it if he needs. Unless we freely stop him. Then we intervene. All right. Next question for you, Tyler. Yep. Tyler, if Moses could be placed into current theological system, wouldn't he have been an open theist? No. <laughs> Simple response. I, I don't. I don't know. I don't know why. I don't know why he would. I don't. I mean, I don't know why he would have been an open theist. Right. I mean, that, that, I, for example, I mean, in in dealing with uh, you know, Will in his opening statement brought up the passages about it never entered my mind. Well, I mean, by name, sacrificed him to Moloch. Mo Moses got the prediction that that Israel would fall into sin and idolatry. They would he'd sacrifice their children to Moloch. I mean, why, why would he be an open theist? Any thoughts, Will? Yeah, absolutely. Um, he he was an open theist. Um, all throughout the book of Exodus, um, we see Moses, who the Bible says knew God face to face as someone knows a friend, consistently responding back to God when God said something would happen and tried to change his mind. There, I, don't, I can't think of one piece of evidence from Moses specifically that someone could point to where Moses believed that God knew the future or that the future was settled. God at one point said, I'm not going with you because Israel is so wicked, you're on your own. Moses begged and pleaded him and he said, okay, I will go with you. Yeah, and I, I mean, as a Calvinist, I can do the same thing because I think prayer is effective, right? I think prayer is one of the providential means that God uses, right? The, the fact that Moses did that ministerially shows nothing about what he believed about the, the, the ontological status of the knowledge of God, right? You're just, you're, you're, you're just, in, you're just, in, it, question begging that as an implication but i can affirm everything you just said and be an, an exhaustive divine determinist yeah i think it's clear that if god says something's going to happen instead of moses thinking oh god knows the future therefore that's what's going to happen which is how christians today think sadly uh he actually would try to change what god said would happen so i would place him as an open theist and I would say he just believed prayer works. All right. Uh, next question. Question for you, Will. How many years did God live in eternity before he became subject to sequential universe? Or do you deny he's eternal? Hey, Derek, how are you? <laughs> uh, good question. Unfortunately, it's not valid. Um, here's why. Um, God has a beginningless past. So asking how many years he lived in eternity before he created doesn't work uh, because we're talking about a time that does not have a beginning. In order to give a certain amount of years, that involves a beginning and an end, and God has a beginningless past. Uh, when it comes to God being eternal, unfortunately, that word has been redefined by Christians today. Uh, being eternal just means he has no beginning and no end. It has nothing to do with being timeless. Uh, Tyler? Yeah, and, and, and I think you know, this is why I brought up the Kalam. This is, I think, why this question came up here, is that uh, if God exists eternally for a certain number of years, then you have the logical problem of an actually um, infinite, um, uh, a, a set of an actually infinite number of years, which just creates countless contradictions and, and, and countless problems. Um, it, it's, it's just one of the problems with, with that view. I, I, and again, I still don't even know what that means for something to be time in time before. T we only know what time is as a dimension of, of space time, of the material world. I don't even know what it means for something to be time bound when there's no physical creation. I just conceptually don't even know what that means. All right, all right. Yep. Another question. Question for you, Will. If Psalm 139 is strictly about mythology and not foreknowledge, how is it that it speaks about David sitting down? Can a baby sit down? A great question. So in case I wasn't clear, I'll clarify. Um, it's specifically verses 13 through 16 that are about fetology. 
all those other verses <clears throat> talking about where David is going, for example, verse seven, where can I go from your spirit, etc. All of that is talking about present knowledge. So hopefully that clarifies. We, we have a passage in Psalm 139 speaking about life in the womb. I didn't mean the entire chapter. All right, Tyler. I just think it's very convenient that it ad hoc that, that that one very inconvenient section just doesn't apply to the, the rest of the passage and the rest of the the rest of the psalm so it does it's all yeah. present knowledge all right and this is the final question question for will will you're getting beat up with all these questions man for the crucifixion how do you get around acts 2 23 4 28 specifically predestined yeah, great. So let me deal with these really quick. <laughs> this, this, I enjoy this, by the way. This is fun. So uh, it looks like Jim asked the question. Hey, Jim. Um, number one, as I mentioned in my opening statement, I believe pretty much only open theists and some Molinists act actually believe in predestination. Predestination means to determine beforehand. I believe God determines things one before another. I don't believe he's atemporal. In specific reference to Acts 2, 23 um it says that it says this i'm going to read the verse him referring to jesus him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of god you have taken by lawless hands have cru have crucified and put to death what this is saying is that it was the deliverance that was predetermined and then they took him and crucified him and put him to death. This doesn't say that anything else was predestined. So what, what we don't have time to go over the whole context, but I've read this a hundred times. The context is Israel is being rebuked and he says, God gave you your Messiah. The deliverance of your Messiah to you was done by the determined purpose of foreknowledge of God. And instead of accepting your Messiah, you took him and you killed him. That's what this is saying. So, Tyler, do you want to respond, or do you want me to go to Acts 4.28? Yeah, I, I, I would just say that any, anyone who can read the Greek on this passage knows um, that, that what's happening is it's saying that, you know, this man, uh, just as you yourselves know, this man, referring to Jesus, delivered over by the predetermined plan and the foreknowledge of God, you nailed to the cross, right? That's the, the, the nailing of the cross is how he was delivered over uh, by the predetermined plan of God. It's it's It's... It's not. It's not these these two separate ideas that are happening, right? It's it, this is this is how this is how the this is what the predetermined plan and what God foreknew would happen is the nailing to the cross of the hands of the godless men who put him to death and God raising him from the dead. That just that just is the substance of the thing being talked about. And grammatically in the Greek, that's just obvious. Yeah, grammatically, it's the deliverance that was done by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. That's it. I hope you would at least admit that. Yeah, it, grammatically, the, the de, when you're talking about the adverbial clause there, the deliverance over by the predetermined plan, the deliverance is brought about by the predetermined and the foreknowledge of God. What yep. it, that is accomplishing is done by being nailed to the cross by the hands of godless men. Right, those are intimately connected. That is part of the same plan and outcome. It's connected in that it's the same person, but it actually says that the deliverance was happened by God, and then you, referring to Israel, have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. Nothing grammatically ties the crucifixion or the death to the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. I've studied that extensively. Okay, we disagree on that. All right, Acts 4. Let me read this verse. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. I will grant that at first reading of this, it sounds like a good verse for Calvinism, but let me explain how I interpret this passage. I don't interpret this passage that every single action of all of these people was determined by God before the foundation of the world. I, I don't see that here, and I also see huge problems with that. For example, God determined that this man would rape this child on this date for this many minutes, etc. What I see here is I see people freely decided to essentially 
crucify and kill Jesus. Let me explain what I mean because it's a little bit hard to understand quickly here. Um, Martin Luther King Jr., he set up a time to address the country. There was a date, there was a time, there was a place. And people freely gathered together to do what he wanted to have happen. He did not say, this person's going to come, this person's going to come. He didn't send them all invitations. So what's ha what, what this verse is saying is that these people, out of their own free will, did, uh, uh, essentially crucifying Jesus, accomplished this sacrifice that God set out. God knew there had to be a sacrifice. These people freely chose to do it. It's not saying that every single action and thought was determined by God. Any response to that, Tyler? Yeah, I mean, it's just not where the, I mean, again, notice that hermeneutically, it's just all over the map. He wants the plain reading, but he doesn't want the plain reading of didactic statements. It says expressly, uh, but uh, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. What is the thing that's being predestined? And to, and to occur, the thing that the they did. No the sacrifice of that's correct. Both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and people of Israel, to do their action, what they're choosing to do, is the thing that God's hand and purpose had predestined to do. Just their their decision to do it is here's the, the thing. Difference. I don't have to so appeal to Martin Luther King. I don't have to appeal to you know. I, I, all this other stuff, like you, you say you want the plain meaning of the passage, the plain, the plain passage, the Gentiles and the people of Israel to do whatever your hand. If I, if I, if I go and I say that, that, that my son does whatever I, and my hand and my purpose has predestined to occur, but I can't say that right. of my son. I can say he does the thing that I command him to do. I can say he does the thing that I ask him to do, that I request him to do, that I hope he does. I cannot say he does the thing that I have predestined him to do, right? That, that, sure you, that's something I cannot do. Only God can do that. So let me just quickly describe the difference between my, my idea of this verse and the Calvinist idea of this verse. My idea of this verse is that there was a need and a plan for Christ to be sacrificed. And that is what I believe was determined before to be done. The Calvinist believes everything was determined before to be done. So, for example, if somebody had to, an itch on their nose, that's what this verse is, is talking about. If somebody tripped and fell in the crowd, that's what this verse is talking about. If somebody had flatulence in the crowd, that's what this verse is talking about, if Calvinism oh, is true. No, 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 no. So that's that's not what this verse is talking about, right? So so that that's just that's just flat out incorrect again. Uh, I, I do not Calvinism think that this but this okay no, no no hold on hold on don't don't try to tell me what i believe right if calvinism is true yes divine determinism is true whatsoever comes to pass comes to pass because of the divine decree that is true that doesn't mean that's what the subject of this verse is about what this verse says is the very specific actions what they chose to do you're right it is the crucifixion but it's that they were doing it is what is predestined to occur. This verse isn't saying that whatever these people you know, decided to do, scratching their nose, right? That's not what the subject of this verse is about. Yeah, but, but I don't think we should shy away from what you believe. I don't, I don't shy away from what I believe either. <laughs> it's just, you're, you're saying it's what I, I believe this verse is about. And once again, you get Calvinism wrong. It's not what we say this verse is about. So no, that, that's just, it's just, you're just incorrect once again. Well, it says, it says they were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. So if Pilate, right. if Pilate had a back spasm, then that's, then, then this verse, according to Calvinism, that's referring to that back spasm. Okay. No, because the subject here, you're right in the sense that the subject here is about the crucifixion of the servant Jesus, which God had anointed. That's the subject that it's talking about. And it's saying they gathered together to do that thing that you had predestined to occur. 
you had predestined right. them to do that crucifixion, right? You don't ex you you don't do a conceptual expansion. While it's true that I believe that everything is predetermined, that doesn't mean that it's drawn from every single verse. Right. So, no, sure. that's not what I think exegetically this verse is talking about. Great. All right. Our last minute super chat came in. So Ooh. I do want to get my super chats in. Thank you, Scott, for the $5 super chat. Tyler, minutes ago, you stated that you believe prayer is effective. How is Ooh. prayer effective if it's unable to be effect, unable to affect or change the future? I don't think it is unable to affect or change the future, right? So divine determinism is not the view that God that God just directly causes all things, and it's predetermined in such a way that nothing is brought about by means, that nothing is brought about by by our decisions or our actions. That's just that that, that is to conflate hyper Calvinism, hard determinism, which actually is a kind of is actually a type of incompatibilism. That's to confuse that with soft determinism or compatibilism. Compatibilism is the view that God has exhaustively determined whatsoever comes to pass, and we freely choose to do the things that we desire to do. I do what I want to do, and I'm morally culpable for that. Right? So what, and, and what I choose to do, what my desire to do, is effective. God uses that as a means to bring something out. There are a lot of people who they use the cliche, God could have determined that, that I will have a full belly tonight, and it goes through the means of me choosing to eat my dinner. Uh, my, my choice to eat my dinner affects the future outcome, but doesn't mean that it's not determined. Anyone who yeah. says that just doesn't understand compatibilism. In response um, to so, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the most important thing, Tyler, that you said, and I, and I, and I, obviously, you know, you believe this, but I want everybody listening to know you believe this is you just said that you do not believe prayer can change the future. I think that is an absolutely devastating theology and is not biblical. Where did I say that I believe prayer yeah. doesn't change the future? You just said that anybody can rewind. No, no. You said, if, if you look response. back, I said, I think that I said, that I think prayer is effective to affect and change the future. I think that I, I literally just, I literally just explained that God uses our means to affect and bring about the future. Yes, but the, I mean, the key that, is change that the was, future. That was what, that was what my answer was. Yes, but you believe the future is settled, so you don't believe prayer can change the future. There's nothing to change. The future doesn't exist yet. The future is determined. I cannot do something that will change the what is determined to occur but it doesn't mean that my free decision is not the thing that affects and brings about that outcome right so the the question the question can you change the future is just it, again it's like your question of of if, if god is if god is free um be you know uh, if god is free to change the number of raindrops in a rain cloud right because you're confusing your temporal view with an atemporal view, you're question begging it. I'm going to say, if, if God decided, if God had determined, right, that a, that a dragon would steal a princess and steal her away to Seattle, he would have just, that would have been his will from eternity past. His, his, his right. free will choice, what he desired to take place, would already have been accounted for in what is brought about, right? The, the same thing happens with art. If, if if, if God has determined X to, to come about, it's, it, it could be by my free will prayer that it's brought about, right? My, my prayer is effective to bring about the outcome. It's not indeterminate, right? My, my prayer is a determining condition and cause for what comes afterwards. Yeah, so essentially, let me summarize that for people that might not be familiar with Calvinism. What that means is, is that prayer cannot change the determined future that God determined before the foundation of the world. The only thing you can hope for is that God decreed that there would be a prayer. Uh, and at that point, you're essentially just a cog in a wheel. I mean, this would be like me, me saying, okay, well, let me summarize Will's view for you. Will's view is that everything is chaos and God has no control whatsoever and doesn't know what's gonna happen. And by the way, he didn't love you on the cross. 
because he didn't even know that you would exist when the cross happened. Do you know that? Do you know that, Will? God didn't love you one lick when he was on the cross because he didn't know that you would exist, right? Is that, should I, should I, is that, should that be how I capturize and summarize your view for everybody? If it was valid, you should say it, yeah. But it's not. So, so okay. Did God know you, Will Duffy, on the cross? No. So did he love you, Will Duffy, on the cross? Yes. How did he love you, Will Duffy, personally love you, if he doesn't even know you existed? Because his act was an act of love for people that had existed, were existing, and would exist. That's not what I asked. I asked if he personally loved you, Will Duffy, on the cross. Well, I, I already answered that he didn't know me because I didn't no. exist, but, it, but it's still a loving act. I didn't ask if it was a loving act. I asked if God loved you, Will Duffy, on the cross. And your answer is clearly no. So was my summary wrong? Yeah. A yes. lot of it was, yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, all right. Um, I just have one. I have this last question. <clears throat> you yeah. guys, I'm listening to you guys. I have this, this this last question. Then we go to closing closing statements. Um, does God? Did God? How was the atonement effective in its purpose if God did not know who He was dying for? Or even even if you take um, that the atonement wasn't limited, right? Um, how does God, how did God atonement mean anything if he didn't know who he was dying for or if he didn't know who would come to salvation or it just seems, it just seems like it's, it just seems like it's pointless, you know, to me, um, that God would die on the cross for our sins if he didn't know what he was doing it for. It was, it just seems, it just seems kind of like, um, it just seems, and you can res- respond to that. And then I, I have another question. <laughs> you guys want me to respond? Yeah, go ahead, Will, go for it. I have, I have a feeling Marlon and I are on the same page on this one. So it's probably more of a question for you. Me too. Um, the cross was not a mathematical equation. Um, it was not, you know, we need this many seconds of suffering to pay for this many people. We need this many drops of blood shed for this many people. It was a sacrifice that can be utilized for any number of sinners. That's my answer. Yeah, let me, so Marlon, to fill out uh, a response on, on, I think, something more on our side is, you know, I'm going to look at something like Colossians 2, where it says that God canceled our record of debt at the cross, nailing it to the cross, right? My, my record of debt as a, as, as a Christian was actually canceled. My personal record was canceled on the cross, right? God knew about me uh, and Paul tells us expressly, right? When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgression having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. It's my spe- it's specific. Christ actually accomplished atonement, right? Will, Will I'm guessing, I, I, this I don't know, you can nod or shake your head. I'm guessing Will is going to fall more in line with like a provisionist model where, where there's an unlimited atonement. Christ died to kind of put all of this into the piggy bank. And as people believe, they take their withdrawal from that, right? Pretty much everyone else in the world who isn't a semi-Pelagian or Pelagian is going to come along and say, no, 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 no. Christ died effectively for the church, right? It tells us that it's for his sheep that it's died. It tells us that it's for his bride that he laid down his life. It tells us that he died for his people. He died for his nation that he died, right? He died for specific people and he accomplished something. It wasn't just this massless, amorphous kind of general love, but not for anybody specific, 
No, when when Christ died on the cross, he died, he loved me, Tyler Vela, right? He 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 died specifically and canceled my record of debt against him, right? He propitiated God towards me, right? God is actually propitious. He is satisfied. That's what propitious means. The wrath against the debt has been turned away, right? On on something like Will's view, the wrath has not been turned away. Right? Unless you want to be a universalist, the wrath has not been turned away because people are going to experience wrath and hell. Why you? Why me? I have no yeah. idea. I'm ch- I, I agree with Paul. I'm chief of all sinners. If you, if you knew my sinful and depraved and wretched heart, there is no reason why it's me. It is because of God's good and loving kindness, amazing grace that he saved a wretch like me. I have no idea why. And, and my and my last question is okay so so did okay so as we look at the, the Abraham Isaac Jacob right we look at these Old Testament um, figures where God continuously reiterated His covenant promise with them um, as far as a promise that through their descendants um, He will bless the nations right. Obviously, we're talking about Jesus Christ, right? At the end of it all. Mm-hmm. Did God know did God know that Jesus would come when he made that covenant of promise with those Old Testament figures? Did God know that Jesus would definitely be born of a virgin and sacrifice be die on a cross? Did In he Bethlehem. know that? In Bethlehem. In Bethlehem. Did he know? Of the, of the tribe of Judah. Yeah. So did 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 God know that? Uh, Will did God know for sure that that was happening, or was he sort of like, well, it might happen? Well, I, I'm struggling to understand the question because isn't isn't Jesus coming uh, a decision of the fathers? So wouldn't he know by the mere fact that he would decide when it would happen and he would make it happen? Yeah, but you don't think there's a um, a prophetic notion there um, as far as prophecy, like that he will like like another part, another uh, obvious prophecy of, of Jesus is that he's a stump of Jesse. He's, he's and Jesse was a father of David. So this is no, this is time, man. This is a crazy amount of time before the actual fruition of this these prophecies. So yeah. I guess it's like, it just seems a little confusing to me as I'm listening to you guys. It's a little confusing to me that that Jesus or God would say this is going to happen, but he didn't know that this was going to happen. So it seems a little contradictory there. It doesn't flow well. Um, it, it just doesn't seem right to me because how can someone make a statement it's like me saying my wife, like, and this is a true statement, right? My wife is going to get me some honey yogurt after this debate. <laughs> Cause I want some yogurt. I text her, I want some yogurt. So obviously I don't know what's going to happen. Obviously I don't have that kind of knowledge, but that is the plan, right? But we're not talking about finite humans. We're talking about Yahweh. So if Yahweh is saying, that the, the the stump of Jesse, or the root of Jesse, will bless the nations. He will come from the root of Jesse. Did he know that for sure? Did God know that for sure that that would happen? Being that that's a prophetic statement. Yeah. So he he absolutely did, and he made it happen. So but we're talking that, about how does that correlate with your position? Then, will how does that correlate with open theism that says that God doesn't know the future? It correlates because I mentioned in my opening statement that the Bible tells us how God can declare something that will happen in the future. And it's because he brings it to pass. So for thousands of years, he had the ability to work out his plan so that Jesus would be born when he wanted, would be through a certain line, etc. That's definitely easy for God to do. But couldn't that, couldn't that be canceled out at any time by any one of the trillions of free will human decisions that, 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 so the, it, it's funny, like it, the, the, the getting a yogurt is a single example. That one actually seems easier to understand. 
when you actually figure out the, the, the massive tide of trillions and trillions and free will decisions of Babylonians not destroying Bethlehem, of Assyrians not destroying Bethlehem, of the Israelites not, you know, they, they actually need to repent and they need to actually come back and, and rebuild the city with Nebuchadnezzar. They need to be able to keep their actually genetic uh, uh, markers. They need to stay with the tribe. The tribes could have been I mean, they could have just been totally foobar in the in the exile. They they could have been there could have been a, no way to know that someone was from the tribe of Jesse, six hundred years later, right? The number of those free will decisions that could have triggered, one of them could have ruined everything, right? Open theism is like saying, okay, well, this bottomless cup doesn't hold water, but if I stack a trillion bottomless cups inside of each other, it'll hold water. Uh, it it. It just you could say that all you want that god will work it out but it doesn't right and and, and I, I well maybe i'll save this for my closing statement yeah god 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 can work it out he, he's he's that great of a god i i didn't understand or follow in your example how one person could have somehow undone everything i didn't follow that at all god god no god can track and follow dna right could could one person but but they wouldn't have known that if, if God can track DNA, but if they didn't know that it would have been a, a ostensibly failed prophecy, right? If they didn't know that it was from the line of Jesse down through the tribe of Judah, no one would have known that was a fulfilled prophecy. They'd have no way to know that. Right? So even though God might know it, it still would have been a fail, a ostensibly failed prophecy. Right? I don't follow the, the, it all. The reason why I said one person can fail it is because one person commits suicide early, they don't have their kid. Guess what happens to that entire line of Jesse? Right? That 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 Christ is to come from. I don't follow how one person stops an entire line at all. Those tribes were large. Any any follow up thought? <laughs> any follow up thoughts? Really, it's not really back to go. I mean, if you if you have a uh, uh, if Ruth, Ruth decided not to lay with Boaz. It's all over. Good stuff, fellas. Go through something oh. else. <laughs> all right, fellas. <laughs> all right, fellas. Good stuff, good stuff. So now we're going to transition to closing statements. I actually think we were supposed to have closing statements before the Q&A, but it happens. So, so we're going to go ahead and go to Q&A real quick. Five-minute Q&A, uh, five-minute closing, should I say, uh, from both of you. All right, Tyler, you're up for your five-minute closing, man. All right. So, I, I mean, I think, I think uh, we, we've seen throughout this in, entire discussion um, that when once someone commits themselves to the position of open theism, once someone commits themselves to the hermeneutics of open theism, once someone commits themselves to trying to do the gymnastics to defend open theism, and I, and I want to remind you what I said about his opening statement, over and over and over again, he says, well, time is being couldn't do that. Time is being couldn't do that. Time is being couldn't do that. Time is being couldn't couldn't change. We we should expect to see these verses where it says that that God uh, that that God is outside of time. Why? Why should we expect to see those verses? Where where is the defense of any of these claims? They they just they just didn't exist. They weren't there. And what we saw is once you commit yourself to those things, you deny not only omniscience, you deny omnipresence. Notice how he had to say, well, well, God actually, uh, he didn't know the present sometimes, didn't know the past sometimes, didn't know our heart sometimes. Uh, sometimes he, he, he repents, even though the Bible says expressly that he cannot repent. Uh, he can lie, even though the Bible says expressly he cannot lie. Um, you, you commit yourselves to having all of these problems. You commit yourself to God being a, a necessarily existing actually infinite set. Any of you who are familiar with the Kalam cosmological argument from the theistic perspective know the problem that that raises. Uh, you, you have all of these problems where he's just assuming things. And then notice notice we went through, even when, when I said, and he said, oh, well, you haven't presented verses that show um, that God has, that God has foreknowledge. Okay. When we went to Acts and it says by the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, oh, well, that doesn't really mean what it means. I take the scripture literally, but foreknowledge doesn't really mean foreknowledge. Omniscience doesn't really mean omniscience. Predestination of individuals. You can't predestine someone if you don't know that person's going to exist, by the way. Uh, predestine. Well, that, that means something else, right? Notice all of these things, the plain and literal, it's all for the narratival. It's all for the narrative. It's all for these inferences. It's never actually for the didactic statements. It's never consistent. It's never there. And, and notice what comes about. 
Uh, Marlon asks a great question about the about the atonement. Notice what happens. What happens to our Christian confidence where we know that Christ died to accomplish salvation for me? Right? What happens? That didn't happen. Right? He didn't. He didn't love. He didn't love me. He didn't die for me. He didn't save me. Right? He didn't. He didn't do. He didn't do that for you. He didn't do that for any of you listening. He didn't know you were even going to exist. You were not even a flicker in your great, 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 great grandparents' eyes. You didn't exist to God. He did not knowingly love you. He did not predestine you. He did not work all things together for your good because you love him and are called according to his purpose. He he did not foreknow you and predestine you to adoption in Christ. Who are our our generalities adopted? No, individual persons are adopted. And Ephesians 1:5 tells us that we are predestined to adoption by his by his kind intention of his will and to his glory. It's we're told that we're predestined according to his purpose after the counsel of his will in Ephesians 1.11. In Romans 8, it says that those he foreknew, he also predestined, right? You, you have all of these all of these verses going in and going into something like that, and he needs to wriggle around that, right? What else does it do? He, he's, he wants to say that Calvinism and divine determinism makes God this monster because God would predestine, you know, these evil things to happen. Think about what that means in open theism, Right. Let's go to let's go to the the worst one of the what most atrocious things one human being could ever do to another. He brought it up, the the rape of a child. Right. He's gonna say, well, that's horrible that God would predestine that. God predestined it. Our free will decisions, the person free will choosing it, is condemned for doing it because they freely chose to do it. What is that on open theism? Think about it for a second on open theism. It's against his will. It's has it's against his divine. Uh, he hasn't divinely determined it. He has no purpose for it. He hates it. He loathes it. He doesn't want it to happen. He has the power to not make it happen, and yet it happens, right? On uh, right, you might find Calvinism. You might find divine determinism hard a hard pill to swallow. I get it. When you think about an evil action that way, to say God has determined it because he has some morally sufficient reason to allow it, something. God, the Romans 8 tells us that God works all things together for the good of those who love him, even horrific evils like that. No evil is gratuitous. There is always a morally sufficient reason. There is always a plan and a purpose for it because God is moving history. God has decreed whatsoever comes to happen. On open theism, that's not the case. God doesn't know what's going to happen tomorrow. So God sits by, even though he doesn't want it to happen, even though he hasn't he has no morally sufficient reason to allow it to happen, even though he doesn't know any good is going to ever come from it, even though he has no morally sufficient reason to allow it, and he allows it to happen. Which one of those is a moral monster? The one who ha- has morally sufficient reasons for, for allowing and determining whatsoever comes to pass to his glory and to our good for those who are called according to purpose, or the one who has no purpose, no morally sufficient reason, no plan, no knowledge of the future of anything that's going to come and sits by and watches it happen anyways. It's presented as a loving, kind God to give us assurance. It erodes that entirely. Christian, if you want to have assurance in your faith, do not be an open theist. All right. Thank you, Tyler, for those closing remarks. All right, Will, you're up for your closing statement. Great. So the uh, again, the debate resolution is, does the Bible teach that God knows the future? And I think that we'll look back on this debate and realize Tyler didn't really make an argument that the Bible teaches that God knows the future. Um, as, as I mentioned before, he mentioned in his opening statement <clears throat> that there's a verse that says, God knows all things in heaven above and on earth below. I still don't re- know where that verse is or if it even is there, but if it is, that's a, that's a statement of present knowledge. Um, Tyler kept bringing up all of these examples of present knowledge, such as, you know, God knows where I am. God knows what I'm doing. I, I don't recall an attempt not, not only to show the Bible teaches that God knows the future, but it's more than that, right? His position is that God knows the entire future. And so that just flat out didn't happen. Um, my goal was to show that the entire Bible is consistent. Uh, I started with the you know Genesis 1 and went all the way to Revelation. And 
you know, I don't have to, to look somewhere and to dig. It's literally in every single story that we're all familiar with in the Bible that we all know and love. And I have spent the last few years compiling verses in the Bible that show, that state that God is not outside of time, that God does not know the future. And those are located at opentheism.org forward slash verses. Um, we are up to over 525 verses. We've had to categorize them into 33 different categories. Um, and it's just a very extensive list uh, trying to literally say, I mean, this is exegesis, right? What is the Bible telling us? And in my closing statement, I want to go over the 33 different categories of verses that are comprised of over five, 500 verses. Category one is God hopes his prophecies of judgment will fail. That's a big one. Um, it's not settled. It's not determined. When God gives a prophecy of judgment, he actually wants that prophecy to fail. Category two, God exists in time. Dozens of verses that are showing us that God is in time. And again, we have a lack. We have zero that say God is outside of time. Category three, God has qualities that can only be had if he exists in time, like patience, being slow to anger, and hope mentioned these in my opening statement. The Bible is clear that God is actually patient. He's slow to anger and that he is a God of hope. God himself hopes. None of that can be true if the future is settled and he's outside of time. Category four, God acts externally in sequence, showing that he is not outside of time, but in time. Uh, dozens of examples there. Category five, God experiences sequence within the Godhead. And this is in relationship, sharing glory, deciding, planning, becoming things, etc. cetera. Uh, category six, God says certain things happened that never entered his mind. Um, I didn't really hear a response to this. Uh, a lot of people try to get out of these verses by saying, oh, it means he didn't command it. Well, the verses say, God says, I didn't command it, nor did it enter my mind. And so what do these mean if they don't mean what they say? We can call them anthropomorphic, great, but then what do they mean? Category seven, God indicates the future is uncertain by saying perhaps, by chance, lest, etc. I mentioned in the Exodus that God said that he did not lead the Israelites a certain way, lest perhaps they see war and return to Egypt. That's not a definitive statement. That is a, I don't know what's going to happen, so I'm going to just avoid it. Category eight, God says he repents and changes his mind. Again, dozens of times in the Bible. Category nine, God says things are possible that would be impossible if the future were settled or decreed. Category 10, God says he will do something, but then he never does it. Category 11, God expects that something will happen, but it doesn't happen. Category 12, God increases and learns, for he must increase. Category 13, God shows regret similar to repent and uses the same Hebrew word, nacham. Category 14, God wants to see what men will do, so he tests them. Category 15, God does not have all present knowledge. We discussed that in Genesis 18. Category 16, God intervenes to prevent what would otherwise happen and addresses contingencies. 17, God indicates certain prophecies will go unfulfilled. Category 18, God gives men choices and options and recognizes that they actually can choose among them. It's not determined. 19, God more explicitly says he does not know what will happen. 20, God says he will no longer do something he said he would do. 21, God did things before creation, showing sequence in his life. 22, things that God became, so he became flesh. 23, God's people believe that God can change his mind. 24, God's people can change God's mind and believe they can change God's mind. 25, God's people believe a prophecy does not have to come to pass. 26, the Bible says some things happen by chance, not predetermined. 27, the Bible describes men as omniscient, unchanging, having, having sovereignty and foreknowledge. 28, the Bible shows that time is in heaven. 29, prayer can change what would otherwise be the future. 30, God gains experiential knowledge. 31, the Bible shows certain prophecies were not fulfilled as given. 
32, the Bible shows things could have been different. And lastly, 33, God says what he wants to do, but can't or doesn't do. Just want to encourage people to look at this. I've spent a lot of time doing this because my goal is to show that I actually hold this position because I believe it's what the Bible teaches from cover to cover. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thank you, fellas. Another great discussion in the books, man. Hey, Tyler, one of my super chats came in and he is requesting your input on Acts chapter 16, verse 31. Um, I can pull it up for you if you don't have it in front of you. Um, it says, they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and your, in your household. Was there a specific question they, they, they had for that? No, nah, he just said, uh, your thoughts. He wants to hear your thoughts on that. I'm assuming, uh, from a deterministic position or, the, um, a Calvinistic position, what are your thoughts on that? That's what I kind of would think considering the topic that we're talking about. But he didn't go into detail or give a thorough question from. To, to I know. What they, I think I know what they're asking. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they're. I think they're challenging total depravity, because here people are asking what they must do to be, be saved before they're even told that they need to believe. Why would that challenge total depravity? They are seeking salvation before they've been regenerated. Oh yeah, so I, I would just say that 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 to, so total depravity doesn't mean that people won't have interest in God, right? So so it, it's not that people won't want to save themselves. I mean, that's why we have Buddhism and Hinduism and Islam and all the all these people are people are frantically trying to save themselves, right? What must we do to be saved can be also be the rich young young ruler of how much money can I spend to buy my salvation, right? That. The, the total depravity says what what essentially Paul says in First Corinthians two um, that 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 the the man without the spirit cannot it cannot appraise or even accept the things of God and after he's developed uh, basically showing that the gospel is the paradigmatic example of the 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 the, the spiritual truth of the of the things that are of God so total total depravity I don't know how that would un undermine total depravity I took the question as how is it um, that they can be commanded to to do something to be saved, right? To, to repent and believe if God has already predetermined, right? If, if God has already accomplished redemption on the cross, then why are they being commanded? Aren't they saved already 2,000 years ago on Calvary? I, to answer that question, because I think that's actually a much more robust question, um, is simply to say that, again, God works through means, right? God, God works through salvation and it is by the regeneration of our heart that we that god works faith into us um and th there are passages that talk about our, our our you know god god works for us to will and to work um that that, that is by his divine uh, that is by divine creed if you go through romans 9 right the 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 objection that paul gets in romans 9 is it just is the libertarian objection it's if god chooses some and not others if 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 we cannot resist his will how is that fair, right? The objection that Paul's theology gets just is the objection that Will would give and other libertarians uh, would give to that exact theology. Um, so, I mean, I would, I would say there is, there is libertarianism in, in the Bible. It's the person objecting to Paul uh, that, that's the libertarian. So um, I, I just, I, I don't see the problem in saying that, that we're, we're commanded to repent and believe as the means by which God uses to bring his people to salvation. All right. Thank you, Tyler, for that. I know it wasn't necessarily on topic, but I did have to get that super chat in. I don't want to let those guys down. Um, cool. Well, guys, thank you. Once again, another great discussion. I love having you guys on, man. You guys are great. Yeah, um, and it's fun um, to see you guys again. God bless your family, Will. I know you're about to add another one. And yeah. uh, Mr. Tyler, as always, man, go Raiders. Go, go Raiders, bro. Go Raiders. I'm never going to come back. I'm never going to come back on the show. You say <laughs> just nonsense spewing <laughs> just spewing nonsense right now <laughs> good stuff guys i appreciate you both right. for coming you on have, man. You, have, you have the raiders nation we have the chiefs kingdom so we know uh, which one's man. more biblical <laughs> it's all good man it's all good man but thank you guys okay. for coming on man i appreciate you both man and hopefully we can do this again sometimes you know absolutely great we love it all right god bless you guys god bless you thanks bye-bye
All right, folks, another episode in the books, another great discussion. I think these guys deserve a round of applause for that one, man. So, and I know you're looking at the chat room and everything. All you guys and gals out there really enjoyed this discussion. And I just, once again, want to thank you for your support in this ministry. This ministry is engaging the culture of Christian truth, and that is through debate. One of the mediums is through debate, and this is how people learn. This is how we strengthen ourselves in the faith, and this is how some people are able to respond to the gospel, you know, by this toolage, by this, this methodology that God can use to regenerate the heart, the, 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 the debate, right, can change someone's heart through the power of the Holy Spirit. So I just want to thank Tyler and Will for coming on, preparing for this debate. They're great guys, and I look forward to future discussions with them. Um, with that said, let me go ahead and go over some uh, announcements I have coming up uh, before I get out of here. All right, coming up tomorrow, Dr. Jonathan Safarte. It's coming on and he'll be joining me and we're going to be talking about evidence for young earth creation. Um, so I hope you guys are able to check this out. It's a lot of chatter on the, the initial post of this and a lot of people, old earth creationists and maybe some theistic evolutionists are jumping on here and they have some questions for him. Well, he'll be here to take your questions and more. So I hope you can join me tomorrow at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. After that, June 9th, I have a two on two debate. Uh, Trinitarians against Unitarians is Jesus the God of the Bible. It's coming up June 9th at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Cody Sorensen has stepped back. He had a uh, family death, so he had to step out. So um, uh, uh, Merrick has another friend. I forget his friend's name at this time, but he will take in the place of Cody. And they was, this debate still will be going on June 9th. After that, I have Travis Worth versus Rob Barnhart. Can Christians forfeit their salvation? Coming up June 12th at 12 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And then lastly, I have Ricky Crony versus Justin Taylor. Uh, Christianity and Rastafarianism. That's coming up June 16th at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. That's just the next three, uh, next four shows coming up on the Gospel Truth. Please be sure to subscribe, like, uh, hit the notification bell on Facebook and YouTube so you'll be up to, up to par in the circle of what we have going on. Don't forget about the gospel truth. Once again, thank you for all my super chats. I appreciate you. Thank you for donating to the ministry. All right, I'm out of here. May God bless you and may God keep you. I'm gone.